This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. This is a special show for you guys today. We are joined by Ben from Uncharted X and George Howard of the Cosmic Tusk blog. They both went to Egypt recently. Uh, we had George on our show and we've been trying to plan a show with Ben, but uh, we're getting them both on Cosmographia now to, uh, to tell us about their trip and we're going to show some pictures and talk and show some video maybe and uh, discuss some interesting things uh, about the geology of Egypt as well. So Ben, George, uh, welcome guys. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's an, it's a real honor to be here. I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy to be here and yeah, thanks for the invite. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's fun to be on here with some of my favorite people in the world. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Yeah, happy to have you guys. Welcome. Yeah, yeah a lot of specula, a lot of speculators on this shit. Well, <laughs> what do you mean, Randall never speculates? No, I, I never, never. He's I definitive. do not speculate. I, <laughs> I might prevaricate now and then, but not speculate. Indeed, we'll handle try to it. try to make sure that the speculation is coherent. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, Randall, what are the? Yes, sir. Uh, did you did you have questions planned, or were you just going to go with their trip? What do you think? Well, I would like to kind of just first of all hear a synopsis of what they did and where they went. Um, I haven't had a chance to really um, hear the the play by play yet. Yeah, um, I definitely like to hear some of the highlights. Um, what impressed you guys the most? Uh, of course, the Temple of Hathor. Uh, you know, I specifically expressed an interest in that when you guys were about to depart. And I think you've come through for me. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about your visit to there. Um, I understand you went to the Valley of the Kings. I'd, I'd like to hear about that because when I was there, we ran out of time. And I regret that I didn't get there. Um, also, the fact that you guys were in kind of a privileged position, privileged context while you were over there. Um, you could talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm sorry I somehow didn't finagle my way into the, onto the trip, but. Yeah, we are yeah, too. Yeah. You me both. <laughs> yeah, well, this, the good thing is that I think there's going to be plenty more opportunity for it um, going forward, because, uh, I mean, as you said, it was, you know, we, so we had been to Egypt, and, and, and this was a trip that I had been planning for Oh, a couple of years now, and I've been threatening to go. Like, kind of on my channel, I've been several times, and and I was wanting to put a trip together for a while, and I had planned one. Uh, I think in 2019, we'd kind of put that together, and I finally announced it, and I think it was February of 2020, <laughs> and uh, we had it all, we had it kind of all booked in, and 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 we had people sign up, and it, the trip filled up in about a week, and then of course the 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 the, uh, the modern cataclysm of 2020. Mm -hmm. if that's a word for it hit and then uh of course that threw everything up into into uproar and we weren't even sure if, if the trip was going to go ahead um but ultimately we you know things egypt closed down entirely like they were one of the one of the big countries to to sort of shut down they they i mean i think brian forrester actually was was on a trip in egypt at the time i think around march and uh and he got out they that that tour had to kind of end early and and people were flown home and uh, I think Brian, the poor guy, lives in in Peru. He it took him something like five or six months to eventually get back to his his home. Because I know he spent God. a lot of time in New Jersey, then Mexico, and sort of managed to go further south until he got on a, a repatriation flight back to back to Peru. Eventually, yeah. So I, a lot of sympathy for him. But we we eventually decided though. So Egypt started to talk about they were going to open up a little bit, uh, obviously with restrictions uh, because of the pandemic. And so we went, all right, let's try and put this trip together. We went out and 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 said, uh, "Is are people interested in doing this?" Because I, my perspective was, it would be a very unique opportunity to visit Egypt without the the usual, you know, hordes of other tourists. It's I, I can't think of a more famous location than the pyramids of Giza. I, it, almost everyone on the planet knows it. Everybody wants to see it. And typically, any time in the last forty years, really, you would have just hordes of tourists, and 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 it's. 
that's that's you know it's a it's bread and butter for Egypt. They need the tourism, but uh, well, but we thought well well let's let's try and do it. And luckily enough, we were we were able to put together thirty or so you know adventurous people willing enough to 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 uh, to go through all the difficulties of trying to travel in twenty twenty and and head over to Egypt. And and I was really pleased when George decided to join as well. That was just awesome. I was like this is fantastic to get George over there, and uh, yeah, we put it together. And and it 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 was a you know difficult process everyone had to get tests and you have to do it within certain you know 72 hours i think of of getting to egypt um but it it paid off i mean we 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 did get to egypt we had we more or less had it to ourselves on most sites i mean we were quite literally according to the tourist police really the only tour group in the country that was that was running around so you know you'd we'd be we'd go to these sites in these buses and these parking lots that you'd see with designed for for 50 or 100 you know uh, big tour buses and, and we'd be the only ones there. So it was something of a, a unique experience from that, from, from that perspective. And, and it was just, yeah, a, a really good time. And everyone that, that came was adventurous enough and willing to, to go out and do it. So it was, it was an excellent group of people. Couldn't have been happy with everyone who did turn up. And, and as you said, we got to, uh, we got to experience these sites without all of the, the regular crowds. And not only that, but, you know, recently in Egypt, they've, they've, the last few years have seen a, a shift in, the leadership of of their council of antiquities and they've been opening up more sites they opened up several sites in 2019 just before that the, mm. the it was all shut down that some of these sites hadn't been opened in 50 years or more and uh and so we got to also see a few of these sites that are really only been open to the public for the first time yeah it was incredible timing you know you had the the sites opened up in late 19 and the tourist uh, visits closed down in early 2020. So we were able to be some of the original intrepid people to go into some of these locations. And, and indeed in Cairo, we saw some parking lots filled with hundreds of idle tour buses. Oh, yeah. And I, I think I only saw one other tour bus the entire time we that were there and they had maybe a dozen people and they were from Abu Dhabi. So, right. Yeah, it was it was an empty country everywhere we went, which was a, a very very special treat. You're able to take photographs of some of the sites that, you know, National Geographic couldn't take unless they cleared everyone out. You know, right. it was uh, it was a clean slate and a wonderful time. Yeah, and I, and I think I mean I, I think this opportunity is going to continue for the next year or so for people to, to that wanted to go and, and try and experience that. Egypt obviously really desperately needs the tourism. Uh, and that was you know, the, the people, mm. the locals were really happy to see us. I think uh, talking to with Yusuf, who was our, our tour guide, was saying, you know, people see it as a, a sign of hope that, that you know, the, the tourist tourism is coming back. It's it's slowly going to start opening up because, you know, these guys are, are, are so many people that just depend on 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 tourism. And, and they've really been having a hard time of it uh, over the last year. So surely we had over a thousand several probably several thousand people greet us with welcome 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 you know just yeah. sincere you know looks of joy on their face to get just see someone you know coming back into the country and as the tour bus drove through some of the you know packed small villages and of course the city of cairo as people looked up to the bus they smiled you know and that's yeah. just a wonderful feeling to feel like you were you know some of the first bring back hope for what's one of their main drivers of their economy. Indeed. Ben, before we get going too much into the Egypt trip, do you want to take a minute or three and just talk about what you do with your podcast and your videos? Sure. Just to introduce yeah, to yeah, our, our audience, if it's not a full crossover, let us know about <laughs> you a little bit. Oh, thanks, Brad. Yeah, cheers. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I, I run the Uncharted X channel. It's a cha it's a channel on YouTube, UnchartedX.com is the website. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to have Randall as a guest on on my little show. I do the occasional podcast, but mostly I I try and produce, I, I sort of call them mini documentaries about various topics dealing with, uh, well, just ancient history that and not 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 specifically just, just uh, I guess, uh, Egyptian civilization, things like that. I also touch on the younger Dryas. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm fascinated with uh, the overall picture of history. I, I think that in a lot of cases, our, our, the story of the original, or I guess the, uh, the, 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 the birth of civilization. I think our, our whole story of history, as we've come through from, you know, Stone Age to, to, to the rise of civilization, which is apparently only happened in the last six thousand years, has, is facing a lot of challenges, and a lot of those challenges come not just from 
you know, the field of archaeology and, and Egyptology and history itself, but also from the adjacent fields of science, like of science, like paleoclimatology, the Younger Dryas extension of the human timeline. So I try to put all those videos together. I've spent the last probably ten years traveling around trying to um, document and investigate this from a lot of a lot of a lot of these perspectives because I think there's a lot of evidence for uh, certainly more advanced civilizations in the past. I think there's a strong case to be made for inheritance and renovation and reuse of of various structures and i think a lot of that shows up in the in the technological evidence that's in the stonework and this is south america easter island egypt a lot of other places as well and i, I kind of focus on that element of it because my, my background was technology I, I spent 20 years in the it industry as a technologist um, i was in the chief technology cto office for, for hewlett packard uh, for quite a while before i just i just i just became so uh, more in, engaged in this field and after actually traveling with Graham Hancock, I, I managed to tour with him for a couple of weeks through Peru and then a couple of years later through Egypt as well. And then I was just, I was kind of lost to it and I, I had to try and quit that day job to try and try and uh, to try and do this and, and spend my time looking at this um, uh, full time, I guess. HP's but, yeah, loss was our gain. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Excellent. And George runs the Cosmic Tusk blog and website you want to you want to throw out some about that you've been a guest with us before but uh yeah that's that's yeah. been 40 episodes ago so yeah we're that's right have you back too bud i'm just a simple old-fashioned blogger you know which almost is kind of an archaic internet term now but that's that, that that's my place and i'm happy to do it and try to get one out a week or you know at least every couple of weeks but i built up to about a thousand posts over the last 10 years this will be the 11th anniversary this january so this uh, about this week, actually, January 10th, yeah. uh, 11 yeah. years. And um, I just wanted to try to keep it, you know, see if I could get a post out a, a week. And uh, I, I think I've kept up uh, with that as you average it. But my, my blog and my interest uh, focus on the Younger Dryas event specifically, um, generally not uh, at the Cosmic Tusk concerned with ancient civilizations and precursor civilizations, because I try to kind of stick to my knitting. Um, but I've always been fascinated, just like anybody in the in, in, with, with with these interests are. So this was a little bit of me going over there to see, you know, uh, are all the corollary and more speculative parts of the Younger Dryas theory, you know, the Graham Hancock's work, would, would I see things in Egypt that that would um, that would bring personal credibility to them? Because I've always been fascinated by it. But could I see it myself? And uh, I would say, indeed, I did. So it just increased my confidence that, that Graham's on to something. But uh, as a general matter, the Cosmic Tusk is concerned with the, the published science of um, the Younger Dryas about 12,800 years ago. And some panspermia. You all, don't forget. To yeah, yeah. That. Well, we, we you know, it took a yeah. break this week, uh, excuse me, <laughs> in 2020 and, and still are. And it mixed it up with a lot of panspermia and yeah. the work of oil and wickramasine. Because, That's right. Uh, there's a lot of crossover with them and the Younger Dryas group, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, kind of a heretical scientists that believe things are from space that we don't appreciate. That's right. So uh, thanks for mentioning that, Russ. I appreciate it. About 20 years ago or so, and I, oh, gosh, maybe 25 years ago, because I was already very interested in the Younger Dryas period when I met Brad. So that's been, what, close to 24 years ago. So that was around that time that I was giving some talks about it, trying to, you know, get people interested in it. And uh, I stumbled upon some of George's work. I Where would that have been that long uh, ago? That would have been my old website, georgehoward.net. I shouldn't even say it. You know, okay, it was, that's what it would have been. And I remember using some quotes from George. Oh, I said, a, a, having no idea who he was, but thinking, you know, someday I got to meet this guy. Ah, I so, the same, Randall, and it's been great over the last, you know, six, seven years to to get to know you, man. That's been one of the best parts about it. We well, that's certainly the, same track. the feeling's mutual, George. So, yeah, I've been a, a an admirer of your research and a fan of you personally now for quite a long time. So thank you. Well, it's fun to be able to communicate this stuff that we just used to put in text on websites. Yeah. And who would have known that that now we're regularly doing and you truly regularly on a weekly basis are providing video content and talk and chat and conversations with interesting people. 
you know, it's just in the last two years, it's, it's just blossomed into something that's even more fun than it was. And that's hard to believe. Yeah. And one of the things that I found very gratifying is that, you know, even a decade ago, if you said, mentioned the term younger Dryas, yeah. 99.99% of the people would have had no idea what you're referring to. That's right. But now I regularly see, you know, in chats and comments yeah. and discussions, people talking about the younger Dryas, the events that went on and, and, um, so, yeah, I, I, and, you know, when you say the Younger Dryas and you think, okay, Younger Dryas is Dryas octopetala, a polar yep. wildflower, and, you know, you think it's just this flower, but, you know, to me, it's like that flower is a symbol of just really a pivotal point in the history of this planet and a pivotal point in the history of our species. Yeah. And all of the stuff that we're talking about here so much that, you know, what you guys did visiting in Egypt and use and, and, and Graham Hancock's work and his reference to a precursor, the potential of a precursor civilization, really all of that ties in with the younger yeah. Dryas, because I've, I've always maintained that one of the reasons we don't really see the overt evidence for some, um, shall we say antediluvian civilization Right. is because of the extreme, extraordinary nature and scale of the yeah. events that that were associated with the transition out of the Pleistocene into the Holocene epochs and pivoting right there on that younger Dryas. Uh, you know, Randall, one of the ways I follow the informally, you know, my own, what's impressed me about the popularity of the younger Dryas is on Twitter. When I first got on Twitter, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, I would go search the term younger dryas because one of the good things about it is it's such a unique term. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all you got to do is type that into Google, type it into Twitter, and that's all you're going to see is our subject. Uh, either people that believe there's a cataclysm or people that don't understand there was a climate crash. And it used to be every couple of weeks somebody would mention the term on Twitter. Uh huh. And now it's every couple of hours. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's a combination of more people being on Twitter, but also uh, I think that the work that y'all have done and that obviously Graham has done. You know, it's brought it to a lot of people. It, it is much more popular, and I think that trend will continue. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly is the impression I've gotten, and I think that that's just really valuable that, you know, the conversations out there have now expanded to encompass topics like the Younger Dryas, and people are thinking about this and looking at it, and, you know, it, it's still fringe in a way uh, to speculate beyond and talk about the possibility of there being a precursor civilization, but it, it's it's grown in its magnitude of of hypothetical possibility so much in the last ten or twenty years, or even yeah. since Graham wrote uh, Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995. Yeah, it it's really the idea has assumed a great deal more credibility. Than it well, had the published back literature is is vindicating significant parts of Graham's work, you know, on a regular mm -hmm. basis now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, didn't the the first the first uh, real published article was two thousand and five? I think that's ten years after after Graham's work. And I mean, Graham's work was one of the reasons I first got into the field because it he was looking at there was just so much evidence, not just just culturally and looking at all the myths and legends and all of these ancient cultures that they literally talk about. You know, you, you can't you can't throw a stone at any uh, the list of, of of ancient civilizations and cultures without hitting one that doesn't have a uh, an origin story involving massive floods or fire or destruction mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. their ancestors living through this and having to rebuild again. So he was yeah yeah. I mean, in, I think as you said, it was it vindicated him a great deal because he was originally looking for causes for that cataclysm and you know he right. the earth crust displacement theory. There were a few other theories going around, but it's not really been since. 2005 now that we have i think it's more than 200 pub published scientific papers that, that 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 are behind the um the concept of a of an impact you know this or a mm -hmm. series of impacts and airbursts that and every that one of around. them can be found at the cosmic tusk with our Indeed. comprehensive bibliography in the upper white right drop down menu <laughs> uh, <laughs> managed yeah, by uh, yeah managed by yeah. myself but uh uh nearly all of the lead work being done by Mark Young down in Australia, at Flinders university. Mm -hmm. Mark's a great um, guy. Yeah. I talked he, to him a terrific guy and indefatigable. You know, he is absolutely he tireless is. and he's going to be a, a full fledged archeologist himself uh, relatively soon is on that track ed educationally, but 
but he's documented every single one of those papers and we have links to them as well as relevant videos. Uh, for instance, from Martin Sweatman and yep. plan to add Cosmographia. And when y'all have gone through a paper in detail on a particular episode, we're going to add links to those as well. So people can have uh, kind of an entertainment uh, 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 uh context to some of the papers, which can be a little bit dry, but mm-hmm. all of those papers are available. And that's not true for many subjects, because I think mm-hmm. we're probably paying, playing a little fast and loose with copyright on that, but we're, we're not uh, profiting from it in any way. So I have no moral qualm. <laughs> and the, the story and the message I think is so vital, so critically important that, you know, Hey, Indeed. if you've got to stretch things a bit to get the details of it out there, that's right. You know, um, because, yeah. you know, most of the criticism, particularly of Graham and after post fingerprints of the gods was, um, you know, the same old Troy. Well, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? You know, looking, I don't know, as if you should find, um, yeah. you know, where's the potsherds? Where, where, yeah. where's the, where's anything other than the evidence of a Stone Age lifestyle? Yeah, show me uh, the, uh, show me the scars, the skyscrapers in the desert or whatever they wanted. You know, they want the advanced buildings somewhere. That's right. Yeah. Y- that's yes. Right, that right. But you know, as this argument is going on, you know, I'm getting into that level where I'm beginning to appreciate how severe the global upheavals were during that transition. You know, between two world ages, if you will, and the more I begin to uh, understand and develop the capability of visualizing yeah. the enormous extent of, yeah. of the global changes. You know, we've been going through here in, in the recent podcast here on Cosmography, we've been going through section by section around North America. And up to the point that we're at now, we're showing, and of course, we've got areas still to cover, but essentially by the time we're through this, we're going to show that there's not one square inch of the North American continent that wasn't profoundly affected by these events and your finger lakes episode was a wonderful example of that guys you did a great job with the finger lakes and thanks millions upon mil tens of millions of people live within a you know a yeah. three-hour drive of there right and it is so clear that they were catastrophically created it yes. even even showed papers where where very established scientists couldn't go all the way and tie it to a global cataclysm, but but they showed that something very very violent and even yes. used the word catastrophic happened. So it's just it, it needs somebody to knit it all together, and we're hopefully doing some of that work. I think that's what we are doing. I think we are we're all of us engaged in the process of connecting dots, and the what that final image, that final picture that's going to emerge when we get enough dots connected. I'm not sure yet what that's going to be. Yeah. But I know it's going to be really damn interesting and I to think eventually Egypt go. And I going to play a role. I think and, where we have ancient ruins that uh, mm-hmm. eventually it's on the edge of things, and we're not going to see it included in any of the Comet Research Group papers anytime soon. Um, but I think looking 10 years down the road when the archaeologists are told by the geologists that this happened, mm-hmm. we're going to be able to you know tie some of the more uh, enigmatic ancient structures to possibly um, having preceded the event. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you, you have you have a little bit of that already, and it's been going on as one of the major controversies when it comes to Egyptology is the dating of the Sphinx, right? And you have some yeah. of the geological evidence that suggests that thing is is f- possibly far older than the Egyptian civilization, you mm-hmm. know, as, down to the, the ten to fifteen thousand years older, and it's all to do with the water erosion of the of the Sphinx enclosure. I think you, you, we're starting to see some of that evidence come out from some of these other places as well uh, mm-hmm. that ties it in. But I, I absolutely agree. Your your work and, and you, all of your older videos, and Brad, thanks for, for putting those out on the internet too. Those older lectures of yours, Randall, just that inspired me to, to take a trip to the Scablands. And it's as you said, it's hard to imagine the scale of the cataclysm and just how violent, how, how it changed the – it yeah. literally mm-hmm. – changed the world it was, it was a new world it, it and mm-hmm. when you go and look at the like the yeah. scablands and you just imagine this torrent of water 300 feet above where you were standing looking at these massive cataracts it's just mm-hmm. it's it's hard to imagine it until you to, to until you go and see it and that's yeah i i uh, I, I love that i use that footage a lot i've got drone footage of the scablands i think it's just tremendous evidence for 
trying to get across the scale of, of what actually happened here. Right. Hey, and, have and, any and, of you and, other folks had a chance to see the movie Greenland yet? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw it in Egypt, yeah. actually. Yeah, it it, uh, yeah. It, it it basically takes the Younger Dryas event and the uh, uh, astronomy of it, if you will, how the impact would have occurred, uh, the context of the impacts, and puts it in modern day. And it is a really, really good movie, as confirmed by my wife as well. She really enjoyed it. So it wasn't just my bias towards an interest in this. It's a good disaster movie. And it, it, it came out on pay-per-view, you know, it... it wasn't able to make it into the theaters because of COVID, but it's available now. Gerard Butler, I believe, stars in it. Yep, right. And what they do, instead of the old uh, impact movies that would have one giant piece of iron that's coming in, right, they, they do it right and show pictures, and they actually use the pictures of Comet Schwassman Wachman, which I know you're familiar with, Randall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is a, a classically disintegrating comet that was well photographed um, a decade or so ago, maybe two decades. And, and uses um, that kind of uh, scenario, but moves it into modern times. It doesn't mm-hmm. discuss the Younger Dryas event, but it has multiple impacts happening at, over the period of days um, uh, across the earth at various locations and what would happen. And it's absolutely horrifying. <laughs> that We've talked repeatedly about the scenario of coherent catastrophism, which goes back to to Victor Klub and and Bill Napier and and um, those guys, yeah, yep, yep, <laughs> um, and yeah, I think that 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 scenario has gained tremendous credibility in the last couple of decades. Um, yeah, I still see people, you know, credible scientists that'll misrepresent the Comet Research Group's work, probably you know, perhaps mistakenly, and say that we believe a sixty mile wide. Comet came into yeah. our atmosphere, fragmented, and 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 struck the Earth at vastly different locations in different hemispheres. When that's not what it is, it was a no. comet which was already fragmented yes. in orbit that we encountered a number of chunks of, just as you would encounter a number of shooting stars over a period of a couple of days. Now, yeah, yeah, right, right. We know that comet nuclei disintegrate, right. break up, and produce swarms. Right. We also know that those swarms will eventually distribute more or less homogeneously about the orbit. But if it's a relatively recent breakup, then the uh, the detritus of that breakup is going to be clustered. It's going to be concentrated, you know, in certain areas. Um, and then, you know, if we go back to, um, oh, even Whipple's uh, whip ideas, going back even to the 40s and 50s when he was first studying yeah. the torrid shower, um, yeah. And realizing that there was a hierarchy of fragmentation events from one primordial nuclei. Um, so, I mean, this is not a, a brand new idea. This has been around, um, but it's been refined. And I think now what was essentially a, a more or less theoretical academic idea has kind of been brought down to earth with the younger Dryas. Indeed. And, um, I'm still inclined to think that there may have been several encounter episodes Mm -hmm. in that, not just one. Um, We know we have snapped us out of it. (laughs) And what's that? I'd say something snapped us out of the younger dryas rather suddenly as well. Yeah. Yeah, And it almost seems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, There was, if the dating is correct, there was a massive meltwater pulse at 14, six, which uh, coincided with the onset of the older Dryas, which was then followed by the Balling, which was followed by the Alarod, which was the warming period that preceded the, the several thousand years of more gradualistic warming that preceded the sudden return to cold at the Younger Dryas between 12.8 and 12.9 thousand years ago. And then there was that episode, which also seems to be associated with catastrophic melting of the Laurentide ice sheet um, at that date. And then there was the 11, 11.6 yeah. meltwater pulse 1B. So Where it was we snapped out of it in a long weekend. Yeah, that's what it kind of yeah. seems like. Yeah. yeah. That there was probably a series of events and not just one, although. You know, that's what I think we're trying to sort out now is is what were the magnitudes of these events? You know, there's no I have not seen evidence 
of any kind of an impact at 14.6. Uh, 14 but then again, if there was, you know, it's possible that subsequent events might have obscured it to the point where it's it's not apparent anymore. It's a big uh, ocean. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I looking at the ice core records, I've always wondered this as, as well, because, you know, we do talk about the younger dryest and then that, you know, that, that deep freeze period. And then we get snapped out of it at 11, six, and we have this gradual warming path and this nice steady climate that we're, we're still in to this day. But if you look at those ice core records from either the Greenland or the, or the Antarctic records, and you go back further in time mm -hmm. from the younger dries, it goes up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. It does look like it was a, a traumatic period of, of, you know, the, the, the previous sort of, I guess, four or 5,000 years before that looks like it was just, there was something going on. You, you can see um, events going back um, well into marine isotope stage 5E, 110 mm -hmm. to 120,000 years ago. And of course, what you have to bear in mind is that as, as the record goes back, it sort of almost collapses like an accordion. Yeah. So okay. what you're seeing is the peaks, but you're not seeing so much of the intervals between the peaks. Okay. If we could stretch that out, so it's roughly at the same scale as as the Holocene record, I think what we would see is that there were there were intervals of relatively stable climate, but then they were punctuated by these huge spikes of very rapid climate change, which we see multiple, at least from the Greenland records, we see multiple uh, evidence that there were climate changes of the same magnitude that brought the Ice Age to an end. Uh, that occurred relatively frequently, however, without necessarily the same degree of severity, at least like as measured in terms of the loss of species, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. But there's a lot to still be sorted out. There certainly is. About our past. And again, I want That's to inject here, you know, we may get back to Graham Hancock, I guess, getting into Egypt discussion, but uh, just wanted to say that we have talked to him about being on the show on Cosmographia with us. And Randall, what was that quote? He said he'd be elated or, you know, some he, he would really be happy to be on here with us. So uh, we will have Graham as a guest coming up and probably probably awesome. at the time when we're talking about the Scablands. Uh when we did travel with him for two weeks and uh, spent five days there going through that territory with him. Uh, just an amazing time. And, and he did a good uh, summary of the younger driest in the book that he was researching at that time too. Uh, Magicians of the gods that came out, I guess, five or six years ago now. Uh, so yeah, expect to expect to see Graham coming on talking to us too soon. Well, that's awesome. That will be a welcome, welcome show for all your fans, myself, and yeah, anybody I, that's following this subject. That'd be great. I, I, I owe him an email actually too, because I've been talking to him for the last year um, about coming on my show as well. I've I swap emails with him occasionally. I, I need to get onto that. But, you know, that's, uh, we, we talk about the climate change and the evidence of floods and, and that type of thing. Maybe I can, I can touch on the, the, the evidence that Petrie found. So Flinders mm, Petrie is one of the, yeah, my favorite characters from the history of, of Egyptology, if you guess. He, I think I consider Petrie to be, and and he did most of his work at the you know the end of the uh, the nineteenth century early twentieth century. I use uh, he's got some wonderful books. You can find all of them uh, more or less on archive.org. A great great source for research. And he Petrie in one of his books, I was doing a, a video or I was looking at at the site of Hawara, which is the um, kind of theorized to be the, the location of the great labyrinth. Right, this is one of the biggest lost. Uh, like well-known structures in antiquity that, that you had a number of the Diodorus Siculus and, and a number of different ancient historians had visited and they'd writ written some incredible things about the labyrinth and it was sort of lost to the sands of time. But uh, it, it, a, it looks like that was found, uh, you know, in the, in the last couple of decades using ground penetrating radar and, and, and things like that. And, and, Pet and Petrie, when he was looking at the site of Hawara, also theorized that this was the location for the labyrinth, but in in his book where he he wrote about this, he also talked about the evidence for massive flooding in Egypt, and uh, you know maybe I can share a screen here real quick, and I will we'll talk a little bit about the Fayum region. Um, let me throw this up real quick. Hopefully this works. So this this and I just want to set this as context behind what what Petrie was talking about. But this 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 bull point. I hope you can see it where it's it's looking at Hawara, and this this is the site. Uh, that Petrie was talking about, but you can see right here that the Fayum 
what's known as the foam oasis. So this 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 large green stripe on the on the on the right of it is obviously the Nile. This is where you know this is for all intents and purposes where everyone in Egypt lives is on these on this green belt of the Nile uh, as it as it flows north. But you have a, a, a huge depression. It's this massive oasis um, that's off to the west of it, known as the Fayum region. And when Petrie was um, was researching this area, there's a number of ancient sites around here that he was uncovering and, and, and digging into. He he was uh, he was the first one to get into the Hawara Pyramid uh, in in modern times. He also uh, the, the site of um, Lahun, which is I just released a video about uh, this incredible precision granite box that's under the ground at. At Lahoon, that's in this area. You also have uh, My Doom over here, which is the site of um, a, a huge pyramid. It was supposedly one of Seneferu's pyramids from the, uh, the the early fourth dynasty. But as he was researching around this area of the Fayum, he he did he talked about the evidence that he'd found for huge rainfall and massive floods, and that the Nile was at some point at a far greater level uh, than it currently is. And and he he postulated also that this wasn't pre-human because he'd found some connections to uh you know paleolithic flints that were also river worn that where he found high up uh in these hillsides so there's evidence of of sort of water worn tools and things that he found high up in the air so maybe do you maybe i'll just read this quote from petrie about yes, what he wrote and and this is this comes from his book which is called hawara biamu and arsenal and this was published in 1889 and this is quoting petrie from it it's uh, and this is um what he was writing about in the introduction. So, quote, in prehistoric times, the Nile Valley was full of water to a far greater depth than at present. Probably 100 or 200 feet deep of water filled it right across. A river of such a size seems almost incredible, and we naturally should suppose it to have been an estuary, but this must not be too hastily assumed, as there are evidences over the whole country of an enormous rainfall, which ploughed up the cliffs with great ravines, while the bare bed of the old Nile in the eastern desert at Silsaya is some miles wide in width, showing what a large volume of water had filled it. A lesser stream would have cut down a deep channel in the old bed and would never have filled it and would never have filled that and topped the rocks to force its present cut. This prehistoric high Nile is not, however, pre-human, as I found a Paleolithic flint high up on the hills to the west of Esne, clearly river worn. The geologic conditions then in the prehistoric time proved that the, Fium, that the Fayum Basin must have been a vast lake connected by a broad arm with the Nile Valley, thick beds of Nile mud. This is an interesting point. Um, thick beds of Nile mud exist beneath 10 to 20 feet of deposits washed down from the desert hills. And even this desert detritus is strewn with feldspar and quartz pebbles brought in by the Nile from Asuan and now lying high above the present Nile level. As the rainfall ceased and the Nile fell, the neck of water was reduced, but it still sufficed as a channel for filling of the Fayum in all probability in the time of the earliest dynasties. End quote. Yeah, I thought that was it's just interesting that, that wow. Petrie is is already is was was already yes. looking at the evidence of massive flooding in Egypt. Can I yeah. quickly share a screen of some of the area you're talking about from yeah, Google please. Earth? Of course. All right. This is looking to the east. Um, and we see the Nile River Valley and the Fayum Basin right there. And you can actually very clearly, and it was visible on your uh, image, Ben, the, the mm -hmm. channel that was mm -hmm. cut through here that connects the Nile Valley to the Fayum Basin right here. And we can see that the, right here at the Nile, the elevation is right at 100 feet above sea level. And when we get over here to the Fayum Basin, we're getting down right at even below sea level. Let's see, here's, you know, 75 feet below sea level. So it, what it appears is if the water rose up literally out of the valley, the wide valley, spilled over the divide right here into this already existing natural basin yeah. and then flooded right through this breach, this channel right here. Yeah. And here we see a streamlined erosional residual which we've been talking about as being evidence. So just like uh, you know, we've been talking about underfit rivers over and over again, uh, multiple episodes and multiple examples, that's what we're looking at right here. Notice the size of the channel compared to the modern river. Yeah. The, term, the term we've been learning here is an underfit river. Yeah. Uh, yes. So yeah, 
there is a- a- evidence and, and there's new stuff too, uh, that's come out that supports the idea that, um, there has been a tremendous amount of, uh, flooding and probably rainfall, uh, that occurred because that's pretty much going to be the source of the flooding is going to be prolonged and intense rainfall. Mm, yeah, where have I heard of that story before? And a lot of the ni- now dry wadis show movement of, of boulders that, that uh, by water action, you know, rounded boulders in the tributaries. And there are no tributaries to the Nile, as we mm-hmm. know now. I mean, you do not have intersecting streams coming in, which is very rare for a river. But if you look at the wadis that come into them, there's uh, modern scholarship that shows that that uh, there, there was a period of intense rainfall where the Nile was much higher and the tributaries were transporting boulders, you know, down slope uh, in a fashion that could only be from catastrophic floods that um, most likely occurred during our favorite period. Yes. And I'm going to do another screen share so you can see examples of what uh, of what George is talking about. I've shown, we've looked at some of these on the Cosmographia podcast, but this is the mouth of a wadi right here. And this is behind this gentleman here. You can see an example of the sediment load being discharged through this wadi. So this is not any kind of a normal uh, normal deposit at all. Right. This, is, this is something quite extraordinary when we look at it here. Uh, there's this, this boulder here was not transported by the modern Nile. Again, this is also uh, at the, the mouth of a wadi. So mm-hmm. this right here is testimony to the power of these hydraulic events that swept over Egypt, not only Egypt, but the whole area around uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, yeah. the Kuwait, the peninsula, the Persian Gulf area. All of these areas were subject to uh, these massive events. Again, here, a boulder train uh, deposited the mouth of a wadi. You can see this is um, clearly, clearly catastrophic flooding. And when these boulders were deposited, of course, um, except for the smaller ones and occasional flash floods, not a whole lot of geomorphic work has been affected on these boulder streams that you see here because they're too massive. Yeah. These are fossilized features, the very same kind that we've been looking at over and over again here now in, um, you know, in North America. This this is the mouth of the wadi here, and this shows a high water mark um, that filled the entire basin. So you know that if that filled the basin uh, to this level, uh, when it was confined to the wadi, it would have been much deeper. And then, of course, we see the the sedimentary debris fan that's discharged, that's deposited by the discharge out of the mouth of the wadi. So, yeah, this is the kind of thing that, um, hmm. and here we see, we've been learning about this in our podcast, imbrication. And yeah. I think Russ and Kyle recall that. And notice I've, I've, I've put an arrow here so that you can actually see what direction the water flow would have been. This is the stacking of boulders that, um, is what is what we call imbrication, and it's uh, it's a, a pretty much a well demonstrated effect of of major water flows. Um, so that's one of the things you look at, and it's also a paleo current directional indicator because the uh, the tilting of the boulders is going to be downstream, and this is a massive deposit of alluvium. So this is the this is the stuff that's you got a picture that the discharge coming off the deserts and flowing into the to the lower lands, it's not water as we think of it. It's more like a slurry. It's like a it's like a cataclysmic mud flow. And if you look at this thick layer of alluvium right here, you can see that the kind of stuff that is being transported within it. You see this huge boulder up here. So that huge boulder right there is clear proof that this was a catastrophic emplacement of material right here. Wow. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, the evidence is pretty overwhelming. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. So, if if it, what's interesting to me about that type of evidence is is that so if you go with the idea, so I I think there's considerable evidence in the structures and in the. I mean, I kind of look at the whole ancient Egyptian civilization and the old kingdom as something of a 
of a contradiction to the story of history because if you assume that okay that we went from the stone age to the early period the first couple of dynasties and then you know we the, the, it's almost as if ancient egypt to me appears out of the sands and out of the stone age almost perfect because mm -hmm. it's it's i have a I, I broke it down and you actually look at if the orthodox story of history says that well they did all of those giant pyramid building works all of the old kingdom structures which are generally these massive granite structures you have no end of these high, you know huge granite columns you've got the pyramids all of that stuff happened right at the the beginning of of the ancient egyptian civilization mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. something of a contradiction in in how civilizations advance i mean you typically grow up as our civilization has you slowly advance in technology in technology and capability and then maybe decline but it's almost as if ancient egypt popped up out of nowhere perfect and then spent the last the next 3000 years slowly declining because you know they kept building pyramids and and but they weren't ever the, to the same grandeur and majesty of of say the great pyramid they were mud brick structures and almost as if they were imitating and 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 and, and you know uh, trying to replicate some of these things and it's not just the pyramids you see this in other objects and statues and boxes uh, the same the same thing kind of occurs but so if you go with just assume that okay maybe they inherited some of these structures they might have inherited some of these objects there's a lot of evidence that's, that that sort of points to this idea of the tools were dropped all of us like work stopped all of a sudden on some of these mm -hmm, sites mm -hmm. there's a few really good examples of it the Serapium uh, of Saqqara <laughs> is one that comes to mind where you have these massive mm -hmm. granite boxes and in in one case there's a box still in a hallway like it was in the process of either being moved into or perhaps out of the site but there's there's a number of these of these cases where it looks like tools were dropped work stopped and then if, we don't really know why because you know obviously this there was a, a later civilization i mean the dynastic egyptian civilization existed for a long time we're talking about structures and objects that were supposedly from some of their earliest parts so either they didn't decide to finish the work or they didn't have the cap capability of finishing the work but i think it's it's events perhaps like these that may have been the cause for some of that that down tool uh, approach if you you know assume that there was something going on early in 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 the in earlier periods before the dynastic civilization arose yeah i have a quote here by uh, s uh, i think it's pronounced gideon the beginnings of architecture one of the well-recognized books, um, scholarly works on the origins of architecture worldwide. Um, this is the quote. He says, we find ourselves in the midst of technical advance. He's referring here. Yeah, okay, let me go on. We find ourselves in the midst of technical advances without parallel in Egyptian history. The new problems of using stone as a building material were solved with astonishing quickness within wow. a single century. Yeah. Dimensions of the stone blocks grew ever larger from the small 25 centimeter ashlers of Zoser's complex to the large limestone blocks of the Giza pyramids and up to the megalithic boulders of 18 to 30 tons that compose the so-called Temple of the Sphinx near mm -hmm. Kefren's Valley Temple. So yeah, he was, mm -hmm. he was acknowledging that. And Andre Parat, in Sumer, the dawn of art, uh, which is now, this is pretty much at the same time period um, from 1961. Now that we can view the Mesopotamian basin in all its splendor, it is becoming clear that this flame, which blazed up so suddenly in the Middle East and shed so wide a light, was kindled at several points, each within its own nuance and distinctive luster. Susa, Lagash, Ur, Uruk, Ashnunak, Asur, Nineveh, Mari, all alike were centers whose civilization advanced from strength to strength until at last, and I find this to be an interesting phrase, thanks to the genius of the few and the boldness of many, there was wrought forth as in an alchemist's crucible, a prodigious many-sided art. Wow. Indeed, yeah. what a wonderful quote, I, Randall. I, I I have some thoughts on that actually. So when you talk when when <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, who could just, have imagined? Yeah. It relates specifically to what the, the first quote about about Jozor Zozer's and and Zozer's work because that's in relation to 
the step pyramid. And that's, that's, yeah. that's a, a very interesting structure. And mm -hmm. that's often considered, in fact, let me screen share and I will press play. I like this little uh, shot because it's George ah. walking towards the, uh, the, the step pyramid. <laughs> And we had, so a little bit of background, this structure has been closed for a long, I think like more than 50 years, if not even longer, like they've, they've, they've renovated it. And um, ah, he's well, got I, the Cosmic Tusk shirt. There it is. Yeah, well, I might say that, that there's one coming to all of the participants here today. I'll be sending you one. Okay. <laughs> oh. I didn't, yeah. I'll be getting sizes here soon. All and you got to do is wear it on one episode. Oh, okay. for sure. I've got one. Three extra yeah. large for me, George. I will. And then you keep looking and I'll just get, so, but, but. Oh. Yeah. It is Egypt branded, so it is from the tour. There he is. There's the man okay, himself. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh! So, so it, it, this is an interesting structure, and it's often considered to be the first, the progenitor of of the pyramid building culture. It's mm -hmm. considered by Orthodox histori historians to be the first pyramid. Uh, it's more or less considered to be a series of stacked mastabas. So, mastabas being the flat top structures they used as as tombs. Uh, it is made from limestone blocks, not very large. And then they progressively built mastabas on top of it. And that's how we get to pyramid shape. I, I however, I'm, and I'm working on a, 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 I'm writing a bunch about this at the moment because I, I think, because what, once you get underneath, like the, the quote specifically referenced the smaller blocks of the Zosa mm -hmm. pyramid, and then we, we progressed up to the larger ones. It's what's beneath the step pyramid that's of interest to me and what has been found down there because that there's a there's a distinct technological gap between what you find on top and the construct in the construction of this uh, step pyramid versus what's underneath. And most people don't haven't certainly not many people have seen what's underneath this pyramid. We're about to go into it here in this in this footage, um, but it's of a much higher degree of of technological sophistication than than what's on top. Uh, you go in when you go. And this is the modern way you get into into the to the pyramid. It's through something called the Persian Tunnel. This isn't the original entrance to the pyramid. Uh, it's a tunnel that was dug by the, the Persian Empire, I assume trying to get into the pyramid to find what's underneath it. It's been wonderfully restored, by the way. They've done an, an amazing job uh, of making this available to the public. You can see, I like this because you can see when the Persians built it, they, they had these nice stone columns to hold up the ceiling. And then when we came along, we've added our touch of renovation and restoration to it uh, with the steel girders. It's uh, that's it's a great touch. In fact, it's a. I like to talk about renovation because I think in a lot of cases the the dynastic Egyptians went. I think they renovated and reused uh, several of these sites, and it's something. It's human nature. It's something that we do today. We renovate these sites. We claim them. We find them to be uh, profound, and we we now make them to be. You know, we don't use them as tombs. We use them as as tourist attractions and things like that. But it's that human nature to eventually over time claim stuff, renovate it, and reuse it. Um, so as you progress down here, what you find it in the in the, uh, the underneath the step pyramid, you're directly below the structure here in the bedrock, is there is a massive shaft. This is a huge shaft. It's probably 30, 35 feet across, and it goes down around 90 feet. Wow. Massive shaft into yeah. the ground. Yeah. And at the bottom, I'll just pause it right there. Wow. What you're looking at there is a multi-piece granite box, basically. It's a it's a it's a huge granite construction that's been put together from something like 32 different pieces of granite some of them weigh three tons some of them up to 10 tons um and these are precision car like it fits together i've actually got footage from down in the bottom i have footage from when it was being renovated somebody got in there and, and took some footage for me uh down there and it's quite astonishing and it's at a it's at a higher level of i think of sophistication than the work above it which as you pan up that's no cool. worries. Take your time. Take your time and Take find your time. it. Yeah, it's not a problem. Take my time. I will yeah. find it. Every, so, so, yeah, everything so is fascinating, Ben. Ah, oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah. So, so, looking up, and what you can see is, is is quite interesting because there's actually original wood in the structure, yeah. and yeah. it's it's a con it's like it's mixed together. They they've used crude mortar and stuff to put these stones together, and some of this wood is is uh, cedar from Lebanon. It's it's. I believe it's been carbon dated. I think some of it's actually a little bit older than, than they sort of generally attribute this to be. Mm -hmm. But what, what's even more interesting, I think, is that not only do you have this granite box that's down at the bottom of this shaft, that's only the, the, the top of what is, is several levels of tunnels and passageways beneath the step pyramid. In fact, there's something like five miles of tunnels that go down into this massive underground system at Saqqara. 
And you have other shafts like this one out in Saqqara. You've also got the Serapium at Saqqara, which are these huge underground galleries. Um, there's, in fact, so if you look in this top corner on the, the top left of this, you can see a, a steps going down and it, it proceeds into this tunneling system. Now, what's even more interesting about this is this is where they found something like 40,000 of the most exquisitely carved stone vessels that you've ever seen. These are the, these are the stone jars, the, the thing, these objects that you see in the museum. They found more than 40,000 of these beneath the step pyramid. And these things are mind blowing in, in terms of their precision and their manufacture and how well they've been made. And what's Delicate, and, and, thin jars. Yeah. I've got, I'll, I'll pull up some pictures of that yeah. because and the uh, thousand of them, you've got to wonder where the rest are because there aren't, if you added all the ones up in the Egyptian museum and, and there at the museum at the um, step pyramid, there wouldn't yeah. have been a hundred of them. Well, well he, <laughs> here's where it, yeah, here's where right. There's I don't know where the rest of them are. Hopefully, they're making their yeah. way into the new the new museum or something. Yeah. Um, so here's a good example of one of them. This is probably Excellent. my favorite one. This is yeah. and and again, these some of these are even made of things like corundum, they're, they're, which is a nine on the Mohs scale. You have and and some of them are in, in in material so delicate and fine that it becomes translucent. There's there's uh, alabaster shapes. It's incredibly well made. In fact, so this jar though. Look at how well it's been balanced. Like it literally, it's like standing on the point of it, on the tip of an egg almost. This is the level of precision that you see in, in just countless objects like this one. Now, what's interesting is, is that in the Nubian Museum, which is uh, up down in Aswan, they have found other, so this isn't the only location that they found jars like this. But in, in some of those jars that, and this is uh, something in, in the Nubian Museum that they found, they analyzed some of these uh, tombs and sites that they had found some of these jars in, and they have carbon dated those things back to 10 to 15,000 years old. Like there's, there, there's literally a connection to some of these objects that have been found in locations that are carbon dated to around 15,000 years old and it's well, 15,000 BC. So even a little bit older than that. So th there's actually some, some good evidence that, that good evidence that suggests objects like this may have been pre-existing to the, uh, the, the dynastic civilization of Egypt. And in fact, the, the most famous of these objects that I'm sure everyone has seen, actually, I'll show this one first too. This is a beautiful, this is carved from stone. This is alabaster. It's been repaired, um, just, just beautifully delicate and thin. And again, there's yeah. all sorts of evidence of machining. And I get into a lot of that stuff in, in my videos that in the manufacture of it. It's something that Petrie uh, talked a lot about. It's why I'm a big fan of Petrie. He was one of the first real engineer type of Egyptologist. He was the first one to apply modern engineering technologies and, and techniques to try and figure out the, the, the puzzle of ancient Egypt. And sadly, that, that type of investigation these days doesn't seem like it's a, a high priority for modern Egyptology. Um, they typically don't do, it, I think, as much work as they could be doing uh, to do these types of things. But uh, if you, you'll probably all recognize this, um, this object, right? Yeah. So this is the the famous oh, yeah. schist disc. And now some people, this, this wasn't found in the, uh, underneath the step pyramid. This was found in a first dynasty tomb, something that they relate back to the very first dynasty yeah. of ancient Egypt. And it's just, it's, 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 rem it's a remarkable piece to be, have been carved from schist. I mean, from stone. It's, it's almost, Pretty I mean, good you can. For butt flat people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> To, to sort of bring this circle around is is that I, I'm working on a on a on a theory and and uh, an idea that um, sort of relates to there is one scene that comes to us from Saqqara from the step pyramid. Let me stop sharing. Um, we Never gets old that 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 piece that I mean, doesn't it looks like it was designed by our modern you know um, yeah 3D computer system. It really does, and yeah. there is. There is often this is the, the the way this is explained by Orthodox history is there is one scene and this is this is on display uh, in the uh, Saqqara Museum of Egyptians sort of working with these sort of hand flint you know rotating tools to try and drill into and make vases. Now certainly they made a lot of pottery. You go to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, you'll see these in exquisite stone jars right next to pottery and other things that are kind of from the, they say it's all from the same era, same people made this stuff. So they'll typically, well, look at this scene. It shows them making it. it when, you, when you investigate this at a, at, a, at a thorough level, you find that there are two types of stoneware. 
Uh, there's the pottery. There's also the alabaster stoneware. And some of that alabaster stoneware, and this is attributed to Joza, as, uh, not Joza, but Imhotep as well, as a guy who had a lot to do with the manufacture of this stuff. There's a type of the alabaster work that is it's off kilter. It's not as well made. It's not, it's not perfectly symmetrical. It, it doesn't have the same um, machining marks or, or lathe marks that you see on some of these things. So I think what possibly may have been going on is there was some imitation going on. There was some, they were looking at these objects and they were trying to imitate them. And you've got scenes of them trying to, to do that. And you, we have a whole class of alabaster, which is a much softer stone. It's certainly not, you're not making stuff in granite or diorite or, you know, um, cortisite or things like that uh, with alabaster it's a much easier stone to work so i think you, you've got you've got some nuance to to what's happening here and the fact that you've got stone vessels that that really go back to the very first periods of ancient egypt and any engineer or any stone mason or anyone who looks at these things and, and takes a, a close look at them is generally astounded by them they're, they're incredibly uh difficult to make and it's hard to imagine people just banging on them and and Again, you got, you've got to remember too that these early periods of ancient Egypt, they, they didn't have access to the wheel. This is orthodox history. They weren't able to quarry granite, which is just, I find to be just outrageous. They, they still say that, well, most of the granite objects from the, the old kingdom came from granite boulders and granite pieces that they found laying around on the surface, which is quite literally nonsense. When you look at the quality of the granite that they were using in some of those structures, you have to dig deep into the, into the bedrock to find you know, solid enough pieces of granite to carve your 30 foot column, yeah. single piece column out of. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm working on something that I think can sort of tie a little bit of that together because I, I, I think uh, there's a lot that suggests these were, 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 were reused. They were, they were brought into the culture. I think the dynastic Egyptians inherited an awful lot uh, from a precursor. I think it gave them a big boost when they started their civilization. I actually think they were connected to them. I mean, and this is the story that they themselves talk about right in, in their own history they they call themselves a legacy civilization they're a a legacy of the the time before them they had the, the shemsu hor which was the 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 followers of horus these sort of semi-divine um you almost might call them technologically advanced people that had these mystical powers um you also have uh before that they talk about zeptepi which is the time of the gods and it's you know this is when the gods themselves walked to the earth and uh, according to the Turin Papyrus, it actually lists out all of these kings and it goes back some 36,000 years. They, they, the, the last passage of the Turin Papyrus actually gives you these numbers uh, in terms of how many years their civilization is connected with. And I, I believe that, you know, the same thing was the Egyptian priests told the same thing to, to the Greeks. It's like the Greeks said, we remember one cataclysm and the, and the Egyptian priest said something like, well, you were children. We, we remember five of these cataclysms in our story. Um, so That's yeah, right. it's 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 it, there's one last thing with these jars that I'll, I'll throw in and then I'll 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 clam up. But there's the one thing that I, I do find Excellent. that's funny. If if you ever find yourself in the Egyptian museum and you're looking at these jars, there's a there's a room where these jars are. There's a bunch of rooms, but in one in particular, some of these jars were used as canopic vessels uh, for their funeral rites. So some of them were used uh, to store the organs and the, the the parts that are part of that ritual mummification. What's interesting about that is, though, is that they had mud lids and they, they literally created these perfect stone jars and then they would use them as canopic vessels, but they had these mud lids that were formed into these rough pottery lids and these, these lids are proudly on display in, in, a, in, a, in a cabinet right next to these jars. It's like, well, if, if you were going to be doing ritual mummification and if you have the capability to make these incredible stone vessels, why wouldn't you make a lid from the same material? You have, you have these rough sewn lids that go along with them. I think so. It's just one of many contradictions, I think, in that in the story um, of the early part of the Egyptian civilization. Excellent, man. man. Well, when we look at these stories, you know, the thing that I kind of keep coming back to is, you know, uh, everywhere from all over the world, we have stories of great floods. The the theme has many variants, but there's a there's an, an amazing consistency to the stories that there were these massive uh, mega flood type events that destroyed this pre the civilization that was the ancestral civilization to whoever is telling the story. And what we now know from paleohydrology is that those stories, I mean, they're literally true. You know, when That's we right. look at the scale of these floods that have occurred, yeah. Any survivor, 
would easily think that the world had been destroyed. I mean, you know, see, a lot of the critics use the straw man of the sort of the creationist view of the Noahite flood that you had a universal supernaturally induced flood that rose and drowned all the mountains of the world. And then somehow, you know, you don't really need a scientific explanation for the onset of the flood or the disappearance of the water. It's all supernatural, right? A lot of the gradualist and uniformitarian uh, critics over the last century have basically demolished that model of a flood without understanding that when you have floods that might be measured in half a billion cubic feet per second, which is now very well documented, yes, it's going to wipe out such large swaths of the Earth's surface that anybody who, by luck of the draw or whatever, manages to survive is going to, as far as they're concerned, think, well, the world has been destroyed. Their world has literally been destroyed. Now, the point I'm getting at, though, is that as science is now verifying that there is a a, a, a a credible basis to the stories of these great floods and catastrophes, well, now maybe the implication is that we should take a look at the other side of the, the stories, which is talking about what preexisted these cataclysms, that there was another order of things. This is, an, as Ben was talking about, the Zeptepi, the period, the era of the gods. This is not, this idea is not confined just to Egypt. It's found all over the world. Right. So if, if, if within certain boundaries of, of, uh, credibility, we do allow for the fact that, yes, there have been multiple world-destroying floods in the history of the earth, and we can now document that that these have happened since human beings have been on the earth. And what Ben was referring to earlier about, for example, the Greenland ice cores, when we begin to look at the association between um, these great hydraulic events and geomorphic events and the climate and environmental changes that we that appear to have been associated with them and understanding that there is a literal truth to this aspect of the ancient t- stories well i think the implication is as well we should really consider what literal truth happens to be behind the 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 counterpart the complement of these stories which is what went before and this is the thing that I think we're finding more and more evidence that there was something and there's just too much. There's now too much that, that the old models of prehistory, the, 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 the untold millennia of hunter gatherers, that there is definitely more to the story than yeah. that. That's right. Yeah, and there's something of a cavalier disregard for those stories. Yes, that it's been accepted um, sometime in the last century. Well, I guess it even goes back a couple of hundred years that that, that those old stories are, are nothing but, and that these people were accomplished people, but they were all filled with a false mythology that that they created about their predecessors when they seem to be very literally accomplished people, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. that they 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 communicated with a seriousness that we don't um, appreciate. You know, the, the, there's a tremendous amount of appreciation for, you know, this is myth and their religions. And, you know, these were uh, people who had great sacred traditions, but a, a dismissiveness to the perhaps literal <laughs> communication. And if you start, if you if you begin to take it literally and to tie it to the science, it answers more questions than just a, a dismissing them as as having myth. You know, just as we do in our, you know, in our own Christian religions and and others around the world, we we, we seem to think, you know, they hold all these cultures in high regard in in modern culture, but but we don't take them literally. Mm -hmm. You know, if we hold them in proper regard, perhaps we should take them literally. And that they say their gods were in human forms and their gods brought them great knowledge and their gods came from a time before that was destroyed. Um. When you when I was on the Snake Brothers show a few weeks ago, I said that really personally I find the most compelling thing that all these cultures told us this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
you know, why not go ahead and pursue a literal interpretation of that in context of the evidence that we've discovered in the last 15 or 20 years? Precisely my yeah. point. Yeah. Been subjected over the last century or even going into the 19th century of a sort of a cultural chauvinism that yeah. we have Excellent. assumed that we exactly. have achieved pinnacles of knowledge and understanding of how reality works that's unprecedented and that any assumption about what may have evolved in terms of civilization in prehistory, the, the projection is, well, it would have to look like the one we've created. Right. Right. Where, where there could be parallel lines of evolution, cultural evolution that look nothing like what we've created. Um, and we need to be open to that kind of an idea. And, you know, the infrastructure that we are seeing, you know, when you look at, Ben brought up the Sphinx earlier, and we could look at that a little bit too. Um, you know, I've looked at that ever since I first read John Anthony West in the 70s, <laughs> literally his book yeah. Serpent in the Sky in the 70s. And then, you know, yeah. subsequent to that, Robert Schock's work, which confirms, and then, you know, diving into the criticisms of it and realizing that the more I looked at the criticisms of the, the, the water erosion on the Sphinx and the implication of it being much older, uh, the less substance there was to those criticisms until right. it got to the point that there was really nothing there. Well, yeah, there's a highway that goes nearby the, the Sphinx enclosure and in such and such a year and such and such a month, a block fell off the shoulder of the Sphinx. Right. So why do we need, you know, well, a block falling off the shoulder of the Sphinx back in the 1980s is has nothing really to do with the erosion that we see on, on the enclosure, the Sphinx enclosure. And I got some slides we could perhaps look at after we take a little break, um, showing the nature of the erosion of the uh, enclosure. Although I want to see more slides from you guys. Yeah. So yeah, why don't we sure. take a few minutes break and then yes. uh, reconvene and uh, see what happens. Hear more okay. of their story, for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 72 minutes, good spot. All right, I shall return. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, joined by Ben from Uncharted X and George from the Cosmic Tusk. Man, guys, it's been fantastic hearing, uh, hearing about y'all's trip. And um, before we get back into the trip, we wanted to mention CBDfromthegods.com. Uh, go check them out, order something, enter the promo code RC Ships Free, and you'll get free shipping. Randall's showing Randall's, you the ball uh, there. Randall's restocked himself. <laughs> uh, that really helps us out here on the podcast, and uh, we appreciate everybody who has done that. So Absolutely. And it's been um, very beneficial. I've talked about it multiple times over the last couple of months, my experimentation with it, and um, I plan to keep on. Uh, I think the benefits are manifold, and of the whole CBD oil phenomena, Mm -hmm. But the trick is finding one that you can put a little bit of trust in and who really puts purity above all else. And I think we found one with this particular company uh, after trying four or five different brands. So um, stick with these guys for a while. And it tastes good. And it does. Rel yeah. Relatively speaking for CBD oil. Yeah. For CBD oil, relatively speaking, it does taste fairly good. That's um, right. It's tolerable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a hint of chocolate. Mm, a hint Not of taking it for the taste. Hint of chocolate. Yes. <laughs> Good stuff. So uh, we've been talking about some interesting things here, guys. Uh, I would like to see if a little bit more of your trip. Yeah. So, um, whatever the highlights were, and we can always segue off into some uh, associated discussion. But why don't we dive into whatever you want to? go into um all right 
Uh, we okay. didn't discuss it during the break, but I want to make sure to get to the Assyrian. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's let's turn the unfinished. But you go where you were planning to go first, sir. Yeah. Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you. Yes, you, Ben. Anyway, it all comes me. down to you, Ben. <laughs> I was so we were talking about the break. Let me find uh, the Assyrian, and I let me let me maybe find a, a video of it. We can look at it briefly. I found that to be the best evidence. That was what really uh, justified Graham's work for me. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that was it was so clear for the mainstream Egyptologist to say that the the temple above was can constructed at the same time as the the basement behind and below simply uh did not add up for me it was completely right. different architecture mm -hmm. one was based on the other one was out of respect for the other so yeah i i have i i, I have some good uh high level shots of the assyrian here why well, are you looking for that i don't maybe you can do both these i'm just did you say that you organized this tour? You've been over there enough time to have the contacts and you pulled all the group together? Is yeah, right? I did. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Awesome. so I've been there several times, yeah, and I made some good contacts over there. And, and particularly, uh, I want to put a little plug in for the Comet School, uh, and particularly Yusuf A1. If you, anyone who's seen my videos will, will recognize Yusuf A1. Um, wonderful guy, good friend of mine. He's 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 the son of Hakim L A1, who, is, who has always been considered... Um, sort of the he was like a like an indigenous wisdom keeper he he literally was one of the people that like collected the 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 tales and the stories of ancient egypt and this is we were talking briefly about the what was the the term um cultural um chauvinism and this is yeah this is the before and so hakim's on the other side of that where he but before uh you know, but before we the the west came in and and there's definitely this anthropological view of like whenever you classify another another culture or species you have to do so from the perspective of well they're within our perspective you know it's like you've got to put them in a box and you've got to stand up and somehow be superior to it as if there's nothing of that culture that you couldn't possibly understand and so he was very mm -hmm. much on the other side of that before before all of that so he yusuf so yusuf has this upbringing of this very famous and his father was quite famous um in a lot of circles a very well-known tour guide a lot of like stephen mailer's books were uh, based on uh on Hakim's work. So Yusuf grew up literally across the road from the Sphinx. Yeah. And he's, he's a crack he, at the, yeah, basically his place, you, the yeah. fifth story of his, of his building where he has his store at the bottom and his family home is there on his balcony. You look right out at the Sphinx and the pyramids. It's an incredible uh, experience. Actually, I've, been, I've spent a few nights up there and, um, you know, he grew up having his father's knowledge. He grew up using the geezer and these sites as his playground. He's a, a, a practicing stonemason, so he has a really good practical understanding of what it takes to work in this material. He makes a lot of the objects that they they sell in the store, so he he works in all his material. He's done used power tools, used hand tools, and he also reads hieroglyphs. Like he's he he under he also has you know traditional training in Egyptology, and he understands the orthodox story very well. So he's just an excellent guy that gives you a balanced view of of what's going on in Egypt and. Um, yeah, tremendous guy. Like, like he's. I'd recommend anyone travel to Egypt with him, and he's the, the contact to 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 make if you want to go to Egypt. And yeah, Beautiful. I've had a, several trips with him, and and he's they're the guys that I'd use every time. Uh, we've been talking about our contact at the cabin events that we've done in oh. the past, and the big ones uh, coming up in the future. Were so uh, guys, sounds like we need to add another one to the list here. Uh, Absolutely, a guy on the inside here con contacted Cairo or contacted <laughs> yeah. the pyramid. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Right? Yeah. Anyone interested yeah, in these subjects that plans to go to Egypt, it would you know make their trip an order of magnitude better to um, have Yusuf as their guide. Yes, because he, he is not over there hustling you on the, uh, mm. you know, as a tourist that that has nutty ideas or anything like that. He comes by it honestly from his, his family and from, you know, a lifetime of experience. And indeed, his craft is stone cutting. Indeed. So, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yusuf Yusuf's a great guy. And, and I, I'd highly recommend him to to anyone. So guys, he me, carved me a wonder. His brother actually carved yeah. me a wonderful little scarab of desert uh, Libyan desert glass, which matches uh, the one in Tut's necklace. 
Oh, nice. Right, wow. which was my personal little memento from the trip. I didn't give that to anyone. I gave that to myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's impressive. So let's let's we we'll talk about the Assyrian a little bit. I'll I'll share Please. a screen here and uh, let's have a quick look. I'll pull this up. So this is I wish I had. I do have other shots of the Assyrian. Um, let me just see if I've got a better. I've got one, one showing yeah. the strata. If you the, no, you have it. Good. Is that it. That's it. it's probably shot. your photo, George. Actually, this is my photos of other, from other people. So this yeah, is the Assyrian. Yeah, this is incredible. So the, the, you see the structure up and to the right. That's the Temple of Seti the First, and you can clearly see that that it's at a higher level uh, than where the Assyrian Temple is. And the story kind of goes that, I mean, well, it, the Orthodox story tells you that this was all built at the same time by the same guy, but there's a massive difference in in the structures. And yeah. in fact, the Temple of Seti the First, as they were making it, I think they discovered the Assyrian and they kind of had to dogleg the temple a bit to the right, which is actually what it does. It, it sort yeah. of veers away from it. And this is what they uncovered down in, in the ground. And it's just some of the most awesomely megalithic stuff you've ever seen. Um, it's up there with the, I, I compare it to the Valley Temple in front of the Sphinx with these just massive, you're talking, and we, we did some calculations, you're talking like 70, 80, 90 ton blocks of granite. Um, and then again, it's all constructed from granite. There are no, uh, inscriptions on any of the granite. There are some inscriptions added on the uh, on the wall here near the the, the Temple of Seti the First, but in general, none of the granite at all has has any inscription work done to it. Um, let me maybe put this in here. And you if can get someone walked you through these sites with no uh, preconceived speculation of the type that we engage in, and you saw these sites, you couldn't do anything but connect the Assyrian to the Valley Temple. Yeah, mm -hmm. they they were yeah. of a piece. Yeah. And they were separated by, you know, 30, 40 miles. Well, actually, no, more than that, maybe 100 miles. A lot further than that. Like, like, yeah, like yeah. this is this is Upper Egypt. Yeah. Um, so there's like, uh, what, more like, yeah, 500 kilometers. You have to, uh, the, the valley temples in uh, in Lower Egypt. But yeah, they're very similar construction in, in how megalithic it is. In fact, this is almost uh, almost a slightly larger scale than, than the valley temple. And what's interesting too is I find that the, the granite blocks are key locked at the top, like it's yeah, not just I that. yeah yeah. It, there's a there's like it's as if they've been slid on or something, but there's a there's like a key lock system. Uh, and in fact, they used to the water level in here used to be a little higher. And, and this is again, this is a special permission you can't normally get down in here. And, and the, this is our tour was geared around the idea of special permissions, and we had five of them on this trip where you have a we got into sites that you normally cannot get into. As a regular tourist, you've got to pay a fee of a few thousand dollars, which is why we had a, a group so we could sort of spread that cost across everyone and everyone gets the chance to experience it. Um, but there is wow. there is a lot to see in the Assyrian. And in fact, what's interesting about it, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll get a, a, a higher level view of it here. Just um, imagine what it took to break one of those megaliths, yeah, snap yeah. it in half. There's yeah. Some of them are snapped. Yeah, it's there in 2000. Surely there was some quarrying. There's no doubt. There's well, it would have been quarrying a long time ago because that was all discovered buried. Correct, Ben? That's right. Yeah, and a lot of the even the dynastic Egyptians were guilty of quarrying um, yeah. their own work. In fact, particularly the 19th dynasty, Ramses and Meren Ptah, they, they were notorious for for reclaiming and quarrying work. Um, yeah, see, and yeah. The, but see, that, that looks quarried there, but there are other things that look snapped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, so that, and it is this, in fact, if I could zoom in on this, I would, but this, this has been quarried. Right. And the idea was to try and split the rock. And sometimes it would split nicely and sometimes it wouldn't split so well. You, you see examples of both types. It was the, that, that this is the, uh, I guess the, there was, and remember there were thousands of years of this sort of activity going on right up until, you know, 120 years ago, probably even a little sooner than that people have been quarrying and using these sites as, as, a, as a quarry for stone. So they would chisel out with an iron chisel. They would make divots in the rock. They would put wood uh, into those holes and they would wet the wood and eventually that wood would, would, would swell and split, split the stone. So they were trying to you know, split the stone so you had a nice even face to then go work with because you're splitting it to take advantage of the fact that the piece you have has got one flat face on it that's been nicely done for you thousands of years ago. Uh, yeah, and I see that on the back wall there, the top, uh, yeah, there's scoop marks coming down. Like, you yep. see those along yeah. the top? Yeah, yep. those are interesting. They look uh, very similar to the to work elsewhere. 
Yes, they look like the the. Do you see the work in the front of the um, uh, Menkara Pyramid at Giza? Also, yep. the, the work in the in the quarry. And here's a here's a look at the key lock right here. Look at that. This giant yeah. block. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's interesting here is you see the green water, this awful coloured water that's down here. Uh, so this structure goes down another ten or eleven meters, so 30, yeah. 35 feet. That's and great. and and there's there's a passageway that goes down there. No one's really quite sure. Uh, what's down there? They've never really drained the water out of it to go and in- explore it. Certainly not a thing I'd like to dive in. I can't imagine that'd be very pleasant. But um, yeah, this is one of the most remarkable structures, and it's and it's definitely underground. Like there was probably a roof over it at some point for sure. These these massive granite beams are over here. I mean, just to, for an example, this block of granite here is probably seventy tons, mm-hmm. and it's come from somewhere fairly distant, and it's been put in place in one single piece. Do you think it was intended to be underground or has it been buried? I, well, I sediments. think it was it, I, it was. I, it was underground at the Temple of Seti One, right? It was. Yeah, it was under the ground. It was buried um, when, but when I, they, during that period, I think. Yeah. They, they found if So if they found it, that's what I'm saying. Like, do you think that it was originally on the, on the regular surface and it was buried later it, by sediments? It, yes, I mean, that, they, see what that's suggesting to me is the possibility that it was buried in alluvium. That's right. Yep, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite possibly. In fact, I'm sure it had a roof. And same thing with the the Valley Temple at the Sphinx. Like that, literally had a second story to it that oh, you wow. can't. It's all open to the sky today, but there was a roof and a whole second story uh, to the Valley Temple. But yeah, this was a, a real goal for me to get down in here and have a have a good long look through the Assyrian because the structure extends. Maybe further. Paul's right there, Ben. You could Oops, see sorry. almost like Peru, where you see the secondary construction. Let me go. Right? Yeah. You go a little uh, yeah, to so, the right. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And I took some good pictures of that. You can see that what's going on there at the top right and the middle right is not of the <laughs> same quality or scale That's, of what you see on the bottom left. Clearly but, not. Uh, just like Peru. Yeah, when I fact, was there in 2010, the water was about four feet deeper than it is now. So that entire platform that people are standing on down there was actually under several feet of water. We caught it yeah. at a good time. Yeah. And and I'm thinking that I can actually see some of the water lines on the stone basin. Um, that's what it looks like to me, too. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Yeah. see some of that? Yeah. I, I, I bet that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah, it probably, I'm sure it is. In fact, I have pictures of it as well from when I, I looked at it from above and I couldn't go down there. I've only, I was only there one time before I, I'd, I'd been on this trip. And yeah, mm-hmm. it, was, it was a higher water level. But George, you make a good point about the different, the different, you don't see it as much in Egypt because it's the dynastic Egyptians were certainly capable of very, very sophisticated work. But South America, it's like this is a night and day difference when you look at the at the at the masonry in South America. There's clearly different phases of work in in South America. And it's one of those things once you see it, you can't unsee it. There's just this massive megalithic work, and you always find on top of it for some reason, like it came later, uh, the smaller work, which I would classify as Inca work. It's like a, it's such a night and day difference in South America. It's it's so very clear that there was something going on in a megalithic sense before the Inca. Uh, you also have a case there of the Inca not claiming to have built any of these structures. They, they right. literally said, these were here when we turned up. All the That's gods right. made them. Yeah. But yeah, this was definitely a highlight. The other one, uh, the other thing, uh, maybe, uh, we can talk more about the Assyrian if you like, or, I mean, George mentioned earlier the Bent Pyramid. So yeah, the that's... Bent Pyramid was... Well, I'd um, say for the Assyrian too, you can't dismiss the, the, the quality of the dynastic Egyptians' work above it. You know, oh, it, it was truly awesome. And I use that word in a literal sense. It created all. Um, yeah. But it just did not have the same feel. That There was simply no way that you would go build something megalithic as a basement behind your temple. And then not integrate it in your temple, but redirect your temple to the south to avoid it. It was built with respect to it, you know, not as uh, not as a piece of it. It's just very, very clear to me. And I'm I'm no Egyptologist. I'm just you know taking that as a civilian. But and that's it, but, yeah. that's that's also similar. And I think Ben has pointed this out in many of his videos about Peru, where you see that the later constructions seem to enfold and revere the earlier megalithic stuff. Right. That's right. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm convinced that the dynastic Egyptians found a lot of these things to be profound and they, you know, they they integrated them into their culture. They used them ceremonially. Yeah. They may have tried if they, you know, they may have tried to activate them or whatever. You, if there was some functional purpose of some of these megalithic sites, which I think there, there's some evidence that they were, like the boxes in the Serapium, the, whatever the, the, the Great Pyramid was for. I mean, if there was a functional purpose, you know, I don't think the dynastic Egyptians were able to, to, to utilize it or to recreate it. So they used it ceremonially and feels they to me like they, they revered it, they respected it and they integrated it into their culture. And then over thousands of years, I mean, it just becomes part of their, yeah, their, their, their existence. And yeah. And they probably eventually. had the, you know, the, the cultural memories, the stories for what they were for, even if they couldn't use them for what they were for anymore. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And Ben, I'm wondering, even though the uh, the um, Bent Pyramid was quite a physical experience and fascinating, but um, should we t- should we talk some Serapium? Because I don't think Cosmographia audience has ever been presented. If they've watched any of your videos, um, they they've certainly enjoyed it. But the the Serapium is such a clear, other than yeah. the connection between the Assyrian and the Valley Temple, I found that the most impressive example of enigmatic technology. Yeah, I mean, if the Serapium to me, it's my f- literally my favorite site. Like the Serapium was one of the things that convinced me to try and start a YouTube channel and talk about it because that's such a profound experience going in there. And it generally, it's one of those places that again was shut for a long time. I think until 2015 or maybe early, just a little earlier than that. Uh, and and even even then, it wasn't a very popular tourist destination to go into. But you know, the the, the it's. It's it's an if anybody hasn't seen the Serapium, let me try and um, maybe I'll explain it to you. So the Serapium is a, a series of underground tunnels. There's nothing on top of the surface there. It's literally a, a passageway down. You go through a door. Featureless desert. Featureless desert, basically at yeah. the edge of Saqqara. I mean, Saqqara is a huge site. It's like seven miles long, but it's it's in Saqqara. You can see the Step Pyramid, but you go down in there, and it, and it's a series of 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 galleries where you could drive a Volkswagen down these. These are uh, incredible tunnel system. We're very wide and tall, straight as an arrow in some places. And it has all of these alcoves in them that are, you know, they, these alcoves in these rooms, they drop down six, seven, eight feet. And in the center of these alcoves are these massive, some weighing up to a hundred tons, single piece granite boxes, which are and all sorts of different types of granite. There's rose granite, there's, there's black granite, there's granodiorite, diorite, there's cyanite, there's um, a number of different types of them, but they're some of the most astonishing uh, single piece granite artifacts you'll, you'll ever see. Um, let me find uh, a video of the Serapium. And it was oh. one of those places, and I, I've told this to many of my friends, you know, that were looking for the rundown of the trip. It did not provide any answers, gentlemen. It only provided <laughs> questions, questions, questions that aren't being asked now. Right. right. It, it, the, 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 there's no one that can give you an ad, It's not an adequate explanation to say that those boxes were cut for the burial of Apis bulls. That's not an answer. So it's, it's, and you get the sense of scale in some of these. In fact, George, I've got a video of you and I jumping in uh, and, and trying to, and, oh, and do you? I up that. close to a couple of these books, a okay. couple of these boxes. Uh, so you can see the steel girders that have been added in modern times around them, I think mostly to prevent the, the ceiling from falling in. These caverns are carved uh, directly out of bedrock. And these, these boxes are the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. They're, they're, they're uh, I mean, this isn't the best video. I'll skip forward a little bit. Um, there's 24 of them. So that's the thing. We couldn't, no, and no one, I mean, Chris Dunn's done a lot of great work investigating the, the, the technological aspects of how these are constructed. Again, remember, they're carved from, a single piece of granite. So they're not pit slabs of granite that have been bolted together. The insides have been hollowed out. The corners are, are perfectly square. They, they, they meet in this, you know, they have tiny interior radius joins. Um, the, the geometric precision that's involved in having, you know, these faces that are, say, say each, each end of the box, they're parallel to each other and also the sides are perpendicular perfectly to within like thousands of an inch. Perfect. And, also, they all sit perfectly square with the top and the lid. So that's a level of precision that when you're carving it out of a single piece box is just, it's astonishing, really. It's, it's, 
and and then you have this additional challenge of actually how you move these things down into these underground spaces and put them you know put them in these alcoves and then you know the other question is why what's the purpose what's what's the why are you doing this why are there 24 of these things um the the orthodox story is that well these were tombs for the apis bull these were these were these were used as, as sarcophagi for apis bulls that were mummified and put into these boxes no apis bulls have ever been found in these boxes in fact when um Auguste Mariette uh, first in the modern era discovered the Serapium, I think in the 1850s, I think, something like that. Um, or perhaps it was a little later than that. All of the boxes were open. They, they had their lids slightly ajar like you see on this one. Um, let me I'll keep moving here. Um, and, and notice, folks, that the – and I said this when I joined the snakes, that it, it's, it's a crude tunnel. I mean – why would you put such a perfect object with no adornment hmm. in such a crude tunnel? Again, I don't have the answer. It creates uh, questions, not answers. But but zero adornment on the walls. If you go into the Valley of the Kings, you know, those are well cut, finely cut, rectangular passages. Into this is relatively crudely cut, but then stuck back in the, the niches and alcoves, is something that's just extraordinarily precise. It just doesn't add up. Is there any evidence that, that uh, water ever penetrated the terapium? I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence for that. I don't know, but I've certainly heard it suggested that that uh, that water may have gone in here. You do have. A, I heard some people suggest that you could. Maybe that's how they moved the boxes in. They floated them in. I don't think you could. There's not enough of an air cavity in these. Yeah. Uh, to do that with the weight of granite, like 175 pounds per square foot, um, you wouldn't be able to float them in. There's no room to attach buoyancy Something devices to, to yeah. them. So here's a mind-blowing fact is that the biggest boxes in here, there was there's less than a foot of clearance between the width of the tunnels and the width of the boxes. So you, yeah. you have to move these 100-ton boxes in and turn corners and get them in. Then also put them, drop them down into the center yeah. of these alcoves. Uh, you know, without there's no room for scaffolding right, or with conveyor tools, works yeah. or right. you know logs or. And in fact, in fact, the, the, there's a lot of evidence that the dynastic Egyptians renovated this place. Uh, they they came in and they they built floor tiles around the boxes. There's limestone floor tiles in the floor around the boxes. And in fact, in one back room. Um, that's been closed off to the public that I got in on an earlier visit. There is, there is a box that has, uh, there's, there's a floor tile in the ground that has, it has upside down hieroglyphs on it on the inside. So where there was something, there was a box, you can see like this inside area, this floor tile and it's upside down hieroglyphs that date back to the old kingdom. So what's happened here is uh, they've taken a block of limestone from an old kingdom structure that had hieroglyphs on it. And it's been repurposed as a floor tile in the Serapium. Like it's 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 oh, clear yeah. evidence that it's been renovated. Uh, the other thing you note is that out of all of these boxes, there's no inscriptions on them. There, there are two boxes that no do adornment. have inscriptions on them. Yeah. There there are there are two boxes that have inscriptions on them, <laughs> and the one box that is considered the most valuable because it has the most inscriptions on it. I mean, it's 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 quite literally a, a joke to me to 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 say that the yeah. same people that made the box made the inscriptions so maybe i'll flip forward and we'll but get to but that those box. inscriptions define the the the, the age creators of the, of the box yeah that's right yeah I'll, I'll get to that incredibly uh, crude here. here it is so here, here here's some examples yeah, so excellent. yeah it's 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 uh you couldn't in fact let me try and slow this down so i can find the spot here i mean you can't um i have a much i have a lot of footage of this from a different side but you just you 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 quite you really can't say that these people that couldn't draw a straight line in granite and there's even parts you see it's been hand someone's literally taken a chisel to this priceless object and has has tapped away at it and scratched it's, it at surface and made these drawings on it and it's uh, like finding a Ferrari that someone had keyed Eddie into it <laughs> and uh, assuming that Eddie had built the Ferrari yeah pretty much yeah. that's that's what I think's happened here but then that's that. that's that's the way that we date and relate uh, these objects, right? That's that's the primary method that's used in the field of Egyptology is to 
you you know how we date it how we relate it to the story of history is done by the writing that they find either on the sites or in objects that are found in these sites and i think in a lot of cases it doesn't say anything about when the sites or the objects themselves were created in fact so this is a it's an extreme example of what i think becomes quite obvious when you go to the egyptian museum and you go and look at some of the the boxes they have there some of the the fine the fine work there's obviously better classes and qualities of hieroglyphs but in a lot of cases, even in those good cases, you'll see these incredibly polished, smooth, flat granite boxes that have had obviously hand chiseled and hand tooled hieroglyphs added to them. Now, I, I had to ask the question, it's if you have the capability of creating perfectly flat surfaces, perfectly smooth and, and polished and flat, why can't you polish your hieroglyphs? Why can't you do your hieroglyphs with the same degree of technological sophistication that you made the object with? And we know that they can were capable. Whoever originally built these um, statues and 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 these big granite objects were capable of polishing very fine details. You have statues where it's like the inside of the cuticles of the fingernails are polished. There's all these little polished details on the statues, but you just don't see the same thing in any of the writing. And it just it it kind of leads you down the path of well, perhaps this writing came at a later date uh, on a lot of these objects. And the Serapium is just probably the best example of it. It's, and a it's, lot of the writing, correct, Ben, was Old Kingdom writing. That's right. Yeah, a lot of these objects was Old Kingdom. This isn't. So the Serapium is, yeah. is dated, and they'll tell you it's Middle Kingdom, late period right. even, um, because of the writing that's on there. And it's, there's some funny details when you get into it, like uh, an empty cartouche on this box. It's almost as if the priests that ran the site were looking to sell whoever would pay them the most to put their uh, name inside this empty cartouche. It's literally an right. empty cartouche. And cartouche being the, the, usually the sign for the king or the royalty or their name. Uh, and there's an empty one on that particular box that maybe they never closed the deal, you know. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's I'd, yeah. The Serapium's just, that don't, if you get to go to Egypt, don't skip the Serapium. Like it's 100% worth, worth the trip to get, to get down there and see these things there. Yeah, biggest box. And as I said, they never found an Apis bull in them. There was one closed box when Marriott found it. He used dynamite on it. He blew it apart. Um, in fact, I have footage of me getting into that box somewhere, if I can find it real quick. That's the one uh, with the damaged end? Is that? Yes, yeah. yeah. So it, it had been blown up. And yeah, then, uh, okay. And, and, and why did they use dynamite? Well, because he couldn't open the box, I assume. He couldn't <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Could there not open the box. Couldn't open there's, the box, which may clue. have been part of the point, right? May have been, yeah. The, I mean, Kyle and I have talked about this on our show, that those boxes were basically effectively locked safes for anybody who didn't have sufficient technology to get into them. That's right. Yeah, I think so. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I'll, I'll show you that. That's... um. The, the only, uh, this might jump around a little bit as I climb over the railing and go where you're not allowed to go. Uh, just jump over the ropes if you can. This is the box here that, that, that was that was blown up. Uh, and just look at the the, the the precision that's evident in the in inside corners. And it's hard to see in the footage, but it shines like a mirror. Like the granite is polished to a degree that shines like a mirror on the inside. The only, the only bulls that were found were found in this adjacent, what they call the lesser galleries, which is an adjacent structure. It runs almost... Across the par that. across the Serapium at a different depth. Excellent video, Ben. Thank you. It, right there, it runs you got corner of that. Yeah, I sort of rushed this around a little bit, um, but this is sitting inside the box. And then they did find uh, some some Apis balls that were mummified, but they found them in wooden boxes. And this is in a, an area called the Lesser Galleries that isn't actually connected to this site. It's right, basically, runs across it at a different level in the ground. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, and that's that's where they get the connection to the Apis bull. Yeah, look and the also lid, its name, the, the Serapis the... Apis, comes from the... That's tough with a bronze chisel. <laughs> it's <laughs> tough with anything, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, Chris Dunn, this is the story, right? He tried to contact granite companies to see if anyone could make something like this. And uh, obviously, the, just the price of the raw stone was astronomical. And they said, well, the only way we could, without actually creating specific specialized tools to do it, the only way we could do it would be to, uh, you know, cut five slabs and bolt it together, and then the whole right. the whole idea of trying to transport it anywhere would involve like you're talking like eighty to hundred tons of granite, like that that requires significant permits to even move it across a roadway. You, you can't, you know, there's lots of states where it's you need it's it'd be a tremendous effort just to do one of them, 
and you have this one place in, in Egypt with 24 of them in, in, a one, in one spot. It's Yeah, and all <laughs> one piece of stone. Yeah, all one piece of stone. And, of course, yeah. similar granite boxes are also found in the shaft of Osiris. They're um, found all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah in fact, there's... Which the, is I in the Giza Plateau. Yep. So you have, you have granite... I call them precision granite boxes. They're, 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 you find them in the pyramids in a lot of cases. We find them in underground structures generally. The Osiris shaft, which was just an amazing experience, uh, which is a, a, a vertical shaft that you have to climb down ladders and there's three levels and it, eventually you get down to about 100, 110 feet or something at the bottom level where it's filled with water and you have boxes at the second level and also at the third level that have somehow been moved down there for some reason. Um, yeah, it's it's that's that was an, that was quite the experience getting into the Asara shaft. I must and say, I, those Nile farmers certainly had some interesting hobbies in their spare time, <laughs> didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> My gosh. Indeed. They were busy. There was some. There was some. Some a lot of weekend work going on. Same as Gobekli right. Tepe, right? That was that was just hunter gatherers that that's had right. pension mm-hmm. bone work on the weekends. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like I do like Gobekli Tepe because it's, I mean, they literally changed the definition of hunter gatherer just so they could avoid shifting the original date of civilization back to that period. It's like, it's, no, right. no, no, that's not civilization. That's, that's just, that's bored hunter gatherers that like to erect, <laughs> right. you know, 10 right. ton pillars. <laughs> did you get to Luxor or Karnak? We did. We did. In fact, um, that was a big goal for me uh, because I'd only been there previously once and I had, I did not get to bring my uh, film equipment with me. It was just before I decided to do this, um, this caper. In fact, it was the proliferation of, of high quality consumer grade video equipment that made me, that made me cross over and wanting to, to do this in general, because it probably wasn't possible back the first, when, to get the sort of footage that I, I needed the first time I went there. But yeah, we got to Luxor and Karnak, uh, got over to the West Bank as well. In fact, uh, we were talking in the break br- um, briefly about something that I found at um, at Karnak Temple, and I had I th- that's a place where you could spend days and days. The Karnak yeah. is just monstrous. It's it it's is. So it's cute. let me uh, maybe it's just end one. I'll try and find something here. It was very impressive, and that that's a that's that's a good. George mentioned earlier that that some of the work of the dynastic Egyptians is just amazing as well and that's a place where it's really mixed together at Karnak you have some these incredible hypo style halls which I think was absolutely all dynastic work you have these massive rounds that have mm-hmm. piled up to make the columns on those sites but you also have some of the biggest obelisks uh, that are that are still running around the, the planet at Karnak um, I did I did find one thing that I want to share from Karnak here uh, let me go to the end of that uh, let me do this one thing at Karnak because this I found to be pretty amazing. So this right here, this is the thumb of what was a massive single piece statue. Oh, and you can get some sense of scale here. And again, this is actually in a diff- in a material that is harder than granite. This is made of conglomerate, which includes quartzite, which is a seven on the Mohs scale, as well as flint, which is an eight. Mm. And you can get a sense of scale for how big this must have been this was the thumb that was holding something and the other the other point i'd make in this is that you have some extremely fine details in the machining on the stonework where they've they've carved these really beautiful lines and you can see the distinction on that thumbnail really well but when you compare it to the hieroglyphs that are written up here these hieroglyphs are much cruder and you can tell the hieroglyphs have been done with a hand tool they've been chiseled with something it's it's another example of where you have so much finer, finer uh, detail on the on the original object or on the object itself relative to the writing. And once you start looking for this on ancient Egyptian artifacts, you, you really do start to see it everywhere. But the thing that trips me out about this is just the, imagining the size of it. Like this must have been, yeah, a, you know, a thousand ton statue made from from conglomerate that that was carved from somewhere. Who knows where the, the quarry for this thing was, but. Just a just an immense uh, statue that was at. I wonder what he is holding there too. It looks like the top of the hilt of a knife or something. They, yeah, they they have yeah. that. That's a common thing. You see that on the colossi. They're called. There's a, a few colossi. There's one at Alexandria as well that's laying down. That's 120 tons. Same thing. You, you have these. He's in the hands. They have these something that they. I don't, whether there was something coming out originally, I, I don't know. 
Yeah. And if it was then cut off, but you see, you do see this on a few of the, a few of the statues. And notice all those blocks in the background, those, I'd say the majority of them have inscriptions on them too. Yeah. So that those aren't just random building blocks. Those were all artistic things, which have been completely destroyed. Right. Right. Any and one I'll of just, them that put in a local museum would be the most valuable object <laughs> of the display. Where is the, uh, I want the. Ben, the did you get some video in the shaft of, uh, of Osiris? I did. Yes, I did get a little bit. I did that, not. I was kind of a little bit nervous because they said no video. no video. Is that a picture of all the gear you took on the trip? <laughs> it is, yeah, it yeah. is actually. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> so that's what it takes to do this stuff on the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I yeah. took some gear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had some stuff. Uh, I just, just on the, on the, on the topic of giant statues, let me, um, well, in fact, this was also one of the, my favorite things on here, which is the biggest oh, yeah. tubular drill. Uh, Look at that which is a huge tubular drill that still has some fine details on the edge. Um, again, in a piece of, of split stone, but this is probably the biggest one that we know of from, from dynastic Egypt or from yeah. ancient Egypt. Uh, it's like eight inches across. This was, must've been a huge. Tour. Where was that been? Abu Sir? That's, uh, Karnak. That's Karnak. Karnak. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's still that's Karnak. Karnak. Okay. That was, and then, yeah. So on the topic of giant statues, we were looking at this in the break. Um, so this is at the Ramesseum, and this is something that I think was maybe on the same scale as that thumb. Uh, this, that thumb may have even been a larger statue, but this is the shoulder and original head of what was a single piece granite statue uh, that is allegedly of Ramses. And you can see just for scale, uh, the person that's Liz in there taking a, a scan of it with her iPhone. Um, <laughs> just an incredible scale of this thing. It was easily a thousand tons statue of uh, you know Ramses snapped in half um, that was knocked over so when you talk about sort of class cataclysmic damage something yeah, happened here what i would just say yeah well i mean yeah yeah even if you were quarrying the stone you'd have to tip it over uh yeah and the rest of it's gone yeah right? and the rest of it's gone yeah. <laughs> yeah. his 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 feet are there's still a, a shot of his feet on the on the pedestal in oh, fact okay. we took a we took a balloon ride over over this site early one morning um, and, uh, and I think I have some, some decent shots of it from the overhead actually, which was kind of a, uh, a cool experience. I've not, um, so nice. this is the Ramesseum here. Oh awesome. yeah. Look at that. Cool. Let me find it. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's oh, the sunrise. Yeah. If you, if you, and again, it's another thing to do. If you go to Egypt, you can take a, a, a sunrise. Uh, here we go. So this is it, like from the from above. Oh yeah. This is a big chunk of it there, and then his his feet are just here on this. Mm. Right there. You can see them uh. just on this big pedestal here. So he was seated on on a stool, probably much like this one, and it has it's tipped over backwards. So something came that direction. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is man. fascinating, man. Not jealous at all. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it ain't going anywhere, guys. Yeah, it ain't going anywhere. Well, you know, they, yeah, I got work. some interesting stuff about Karnak and Luxor, but I think we will probably have to save that. Yeah. Um, okay. But maybe while we got a little time left, you guys could dive into the Temple of Hathor. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Let's spend a few minutes on that. that. So the this was this is uh, Dendera. Is the mm -hmm. this is at the location of Dendera. Um, Beautiful site, like probably some of the most, you know, beautifully done uh, artwork that you'll you'll ever see. There's, uh, do you want me to? Just, I'll share a quick video here. We can. Mm -hmm. So this is from the outside coming in, um, just so you get an idea of what it looks like. So there's this beautiful temple structure um, that has been built up, and and from the inside, once we get in here, I'll skip through a couple of these till we go in, and we'll get a look up at the. Uh, up at the ceiling that's in here, which is um, just utterly, um, utterly impressive, mm -hmm. and it's something that has that that was done here. That there was, this is so. This is all the faces of Hathor on the columns. Yeah, that's right. They've and been defaced. They've all been all been defaced. Yeah. Um, but as you go in, I think I I know I have some good shots of the ceiling in here. Uh, Didn't Chris Dunn say he found one off way off in the corner that wasn't messed up? That, that he took oh, his really? from. Yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, he was. I, I, I got a book, picture of one that was relatively intact. Yeah. 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 There's George there, actually. Um, Where taking are we? all of his pictures. Oh, there. that is me. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful site. It's 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 wow. pretty profound. In fact, and and so the zodiac that I know you're interested in, Randall, is up in one of the top rooms. It's it's actually above this chamber, this main chamber. And you as you head up into, we actually were allowed to get up on the roof, uh, which isn't normally allowed, which was nice. Again, because there was nobody else there. We uh, actually there was one school Boom. group here that left. Yeah. But now, the coloring. Uh, I maintain that's not the sun. I believe that was the comet. Uh, up in the, the corner that Graham Phillips, yeah, right. uh, 2300 BC, yeah, and this is like Newt, the, the, the goddess of the sky, she's across yeah. spread across the whole back of that. Um, yeah, I've got some. This is you could spend a, an age, and this is 4K footage too, so you can you, the resolution, even though it's not showing on this video, that's some pretty you good this paint, um, pretty persistent paint to still show the blue, yeah. After yes, and remember, I this noticed, is a relatively modern temple. You know, it's a Ptolemaic temple from, you know, indeed twenty three hundred years ago or twenty eight hundred years ago, something like that, right, Ben? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's nothing. I don't think this is something that predates the necessarily yeah. predates the dynastics, but this was a lot of the esoteric knowledge, and I yeah. think a lot of the their their um, the uh, yeah the, their knowledge in their in their in in their their priesthood, I guess. Mm is depicted on the skies here. And I yes. know, let me, let me go to the Zodiac for you, Randall. I know that's one. So again, this is upstairs. So you can get through the tunnel there, the, the passageways inside the temple and, uh, and basically make your way up to the roof here. But it's just cool. literally covered everywhere. You look every corner of this place has been plastered and inscribed and painted. It's some of the most beautiful work. I mean, it, I don't know that we we make or put this much detail into buildings and work these days. You know, this is there's an intact face. Yeah. Relative. Let me uh, we'll get up to the roof here. Where is this? So yeah, this is looking out over the back. It's, and those are mud brick walls, millions yeah. and millions of mud brick. Yep. It was surrounding it. This happened on a lot of sites. That a lot of that mud brick slowly being eroded and washed away. Um, and then we go, yeah, so here we go. So then we get into the room and just right above us here in this room, actually they'll just to back it up a bit. So you see the context for it. And then, yeah, so we, we, we go into here and then up on this, up on the, the roof here is, is a Zodiac and Randall, I know you have some, some thoughts about this. There's a depiction of it as we mm -hmm. come up. There's Newt again. Mm-hmm. And then this is the zodiac circle, and it's it's actually eventually I know I do like get down on the ground and try and film it from the floor just to capture it all in one shot. And this I think I think it's still soot. I think it's still covered in soot, or something like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Nice. The ball. There's all sorts of the, the zodiac. The, the, I don't know that much about this. I'd, I'd be keen to see any result of any study you do on this, Randall. Okay. I think I might have some pictures of it as well, but spinning around. This is why I edit the footage. <laughs> you take a lot of footage. I came back with something like 500 gigabytes of footage. Um, so yeah, it's, it'll it'll all make its way into content eventually, and yeah, any of this, any you guys want, happy to happy to share it. Awesome, man! This is it's all so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it was. It was a beautiful place. Yeah, can you imagine its pristine condition? Uh, right. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, all too. perfectly colored. Well, it was tough. almost like if our churches. You know, we use stained glass and try to tell stories, but it's like if the walls of our churches told, you know, actually spelled out yeah, the Bible, right? Uh, it's like the Temple of Seti One. I remember looking in there, you could walk in there, and if you, if you could read the hieroglyphs, you could spend days 
as a contemporaneous person in that time walking <laughs> around the temple and just reading it. Yeah, right? right? It'd be like walking in one of our churches and reading the, and I'm not saying they're all religious, you know, some of them are descriptive or historical or whatnot, but you would just walk in the room if you knew how to read it and just read all day. You'd just read the building, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which we don't do today. I don't think we do that anywhere, really. You know, you go to the Washington Monument, maybe Lincoln has a quote, but you can't walk around, uh, not the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, but if you if you went in one of our structures and were able to just walk around for hours and hours and read. Yeah. And in fact, that's, that's the, I mean, Graham Hancock has that, uh, that as a quote in one of the books of so the Edfu building texts. This is another yeah. site that's yeah. like Dendera. Yeah. It's every inch, square inch of that place is covered in hieroglyphs. And there's a, there's apparently a, a part there somewhere that has Thoth that is talking about the, the, the story of Atlantis yeah. um, on the walls of Edfu. That's now right. that yeah. I would like to really dive into. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think the closest modern analog to what we're seeing here was the building of the cathedrals during the Middle Ages, as right. Victor Hugo described them as textbooks in stone. And, of course, right. to visit the cathedrals, it's the same kind of a thing almost when you start looking at the statuary and the the, the carvings and stuff is quite impressive. But um, did you get down and... Uh, photograph the lamps. The lamps. Where? The where? light bulb. Oh, the, the light, light bulb? bulbs. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In oh, uh, in the Dendera. light bulbs. The, the, the famous light bulbs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Got down into. We got down into that chamber. Mm -hmm. um, show me the of, lamps. <laughs> show you the lamps. I have the pictures. That you was a know. tight squeeze. I missed that one. I was like, hey. I, I yeah. I I had to like okay. I I'd already like, crawled through one that they had to pull me out of. And I said, I, you know, I ain't going to do this. Again. I was bound and determined I was going to get in there and see it in spite of my claustrophobia. Yeah. It is a tight passage. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a bunch of places in this uh, temple, a couple other ones. You got to go through like a little square hole. Yeah. And then, and, and sneak in and, and, uh, and it's like a narrow passageway that's sort of behind the walls. And then, yeah, you go down right down the end of one of these and there's these famous. Yeah. Uh, lamp picture. I have pictures of them from a previous trip. I can pull up if you if you like. Um, there was a, it was a big attraction. The whole group was in there for for a while. So yeah, last picture, but we got to see it. All right, all right. Let me let me keep talking while I find it. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Our George. listeners, if they're loving this uh, and they want to see the scab lands, Ben is Indeed. going on our trip with us in May. So That's are right. you, Ben? Oh, really? I, I'm very much looking forward to that round. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've not awesome. met you in person yet, so I'm I'm keen on that. I, uh, yeah, that be that might be the hot ticket bus to get on the van with the van with the <laughs> Ben <laughs> from Uncharted X. That, that will be that would yeah. be cool. Looking forward I, to yeah, that. I, indeed. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I'm. I'm fast. I mean, I. I. I obviously uh, my main fascination is a lot of the, the history stuff. But I mean, I've done some videos on particularly like the 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 South American paper on the, on, uh, on the younger dry impact, the one about uh, Palacio, I think, is that the name for yeah. it? The, yeah. The, the paper that came out Palauco. there. Yeah. Palauco. So yeah. I think it's such a, a big component of the overall story. And as Randall said, the message that comes from all of this, and I think from lost civilizations is, is, is in the form of a giant warning. You know, it, it's something that we should be paying a bit more attention to our surroundings, maybe spending a, a few less dollars building tanks and missiles and maybe a few more and exploring the stars and looking up at, at space. Although I'm, I'm glad to hear also that we're doing a little bit more of that now. And I think, you know, even movies like Greenland kind of put a little bit more of that into the zeitgeist of our current world. You know, we, we, right. we it's I almost think it's a pillar of our, of, of it's a pillar of what it means to be in this Western civilization. We almost think that we're like some, Pre we're on some predetermined path from the stone age to us. And this is the only way that we rise and that we're the only advanced civilization that's ever existed. But I think if everybody kind of had it in their head that, well, maybe we've been, we've risen before and we've been knocked down before. And we, you know, it would, it would give us a, a chance to change some priorities on a, mm -hmm. on a, on a global level. It's a bit altruistic to say it, but ultimately that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the message that I, I, I'd hope to try and share with some of this stuff is like, these, Humility. Well, yeah, and and just you know, we're a part of a, as you say, the, the, a bigger system, right, Randall? It's a mm -hmm. co um, not 
it's a it's a cosmic system that we're all just a part of and mm -hmm. if we don't pay some attention to it we might fall fall victim to that's it exactly right man uh, and that's, <laughs> that's what and, i took out of it man yeah I'm fine and and it's it, I don't think it's any coincidence that ancient cultures all over the world, in addition to their stories of floods and and lost um, lost civilizations and things, uh, also had this obsession with what went on in the sky. Right. That's right. I mean, that's as universal as any other tradition that's come down to us, and I think there would be a reason for that. And in modern life with, you know, 85% of the people, at least in the Western hemisphere, living in urban areas, people are tuning out the sky. Right. People don't watch the sky. I've, you know, encountered people in their 30s in the last few years who had never really even seen the Milky Way. Yeah, yeah. somebody who was that was telling me, somebody just recently, yeah, I was out somewhere and I saw the Milky Way for the first time. <laughs> yeah and this no is camping <laughs> somebody like you know in their 30s I thought, what yeah. yep yeah so yeah well chronos has his hat on so ben you're gonna have to save okay. that, picture, to save for save that picture for next time okay i am looking oh, for it that's gonna be the finale the bulb <laughs> the bulb <laughs> now Bro. i'm under pressure let me find it <laughs> oh no problem. i seriously one of the problems with uh, so many... I've got a pic of the helicopter and yacht. Oh, the spaceship <laughs> and the submarine? Yeah, yeah, that's, the yeah, other, yeah. that's the other famous oh, one. Oh, right, it? right. Uh, this that was a dead there also, yeah. So oh, how, how tall were those ceilings there when you're looking up at that? Was that in Dendera? 50 feet, 80 feet? Oh, yeah, 60, 70 feet. Yeah, I'd say oh, 60 okay. or 70, easy. Right? Man, yeah, yeah, easy. God. Um, yeah. And I saw a lot of uh, not just the faces of Hathor, but also like lots of the figures had been tapped out. You know, somebody came in there and uh, used like a pick tool or something and and removed all the detail. Yeah, they did uh, not from, like the faces for some reason. That's, you know, it's yeah. always worth remembering too when the uh, things like the uh, Temple of Hathor were built. Mainstream archaeologists will tell you that the pyramids were built uh, more than two thousand years before. Before that, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cleopatra would have marveled at the pyramids just as we did. Yeah, well, That's in right. fact, she's closer to us than she is to the pyramids in terms of time, right? She was yeah, the even in the standard the civilization. Even, even in today. the standard. Well, while while you're looking for that, Ben, I'll I'll quick share one here. Um, please please say, why don't we why don't we wind it down and then this can be one of our uh, little bonus features that we're gonna start doing on a regular basis here. We I think idea. that's a great idea. Great idea. We can keep going so, another 10, 15 minutes and that'll be some, uh, you know, special access for the Patreon supporters. All right. It's a good idea. So thanks everybody. Uh, great show guys. Thanks so much. Excellent. Yeah. Shows. Everything's in the show notes. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yep. Check out uncharted, uncharted X and cosmic tusk. I appreciate yeah, it being yes. able to join as a uh, not uh, Egyptian expert, but <laughs> someone who very much appreciates Ben's leadership over there. He taught me a lot, and the entire group um, very much appreciates the work of the Comet School and uh, all the folks that made it uh, be such a success during a difficult year. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, well, thanks for coming on, guys, for sure. And uh, I can't wait to be hanging out with you guys. Ben, this is good. Scablands is going to be fun. I'm very much you looking forward it. to it, Randall. It's, we'll it's have one to, of the only things on my calendar at the moment. So Okay, well, we'll have to talk more about what you have seen and what you haven't seen out there. Sure. Hopefully, yeah. there will be some new stuff. Um, well, I, I, yeah, and you're, I'm just looking forward to learning from you and 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 I've seen a lot of you talking about that that place and having you pointed out. I mean, you're the the expert when it comes to identifying a lot of that stuff. I'm very much hoping to to learn a bunch. So, good. I might go on that Appalachian tour with you guys. Well, I think you should. You should. Yeah. I think you should, George. And uh, yeah, you're going to have to come on down. We're going to have a meeting at the Wheelhouse Craft Pub and Kitchen with some interesting folks. 
Wonderful, um, Randall. Yeah. I, can't wait to see. I, I just had a very interesting conversation last night with, with the author of this book, who's going to be coming and hey! joining us soon. That's yeah. my buddy. I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Your, oh. Name, your name came you up, to George. Oh, cool. oh, the most yeah. profound book of 2020. My gosh. Yeah, I highly yeah. recommend that for everyone. I'm uh, reading it now, and he's going to be he's going to be coming on and chatting with us sometime in the no very kidding, future. but not that's I told awesome. him not until I finished the book. So that's great. Thanks so much. Yeah, great guy, great guy. We had a God probably an almost an hour long conversation on the phone last night, and a great guy. He's <laughs> called, called me from Uruguay. I, I didn't get yeah. for sure what he's doing in Uruguay. Yeah, but um. I would say that and Martin Sweatman's book to me are the two most profound books of the 21st century. Uh huh. Yeah. So have we ended the main show? Are we in the Patreon? No, segment? no, this is now the <laughs> official <laughs> end. Really. Right okay. Now, I, that was Good night, everybody. Really Thank you so much. My wrap up. Thank you, folks. That's what that <laughs> was. All right. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Randall. Thank oh, you. yeah. Yeah, cheese, man. 